Hello and good morning, everyone, and welcome to Techno Crime Fighters Forum, episode number 33. Remarkable number. Um, this morning, there are three of us on the panel to start the, the conversation off. Poss possibly others will join us. Oh dear, hold on one second. <laughs> there we go, I got that out of the way. Um, so anyway, so um, there are three of us this morning, Karen Stewart, NSA Whistleblower is here, Dr. Catherine Horton, particle physicist from CERN is here, and myself. Um, Dr. Millicent Black may join us later on this morning. Um, Melanie Richin may or may not join us this morning. I'm not certain. I know she's very busy. And um, Dr. Paul Marco and Mindy Erkin. We have I have not heard from recently. I know they are still very busy with family affairs as well, so they may not be able to join us. But the three of us are here, and we are still working very hard on this whole situation with Melanie Richin's baby, Amethyst Richin, as you know, who has been held by Rasme Hospital in Brussels, Belgium, and is being held on a 30-day separation decree from a um, youth court, which is sort of the equivalent of the children's court over here, the family court in America. And um, apparently the, the child is still being held. And so that's one of that's definitely going to be one of the topics of our conversation this morning. We have plenty to say on this issue. And I'm, what I'm going to do is actually turn the floor at this point to Catherine so she can begin to lay out how we can talk about this and um, very many different aspects that we as investigators of directed energy weapons crime and COVID implantation crime need to look at and focus and lay out for everybody in the world. Thank you. Hi, Karen. Hi, Karen. Hi, Catherine. Hello. Sorry, I just had to um, reactivate my microphone. Thank you. Thank you, Ramola. I think um, today's episode is incredibly important because um, many people have maybe already heard from last episode that um, I was at the birth of Amethyst Richan, Melanie Richan's um, daughter. So Melanie is our colleague on the joint investigation team in Brussels. And I was uh, present during the birth um, by cesarean section because Melanie asked me to you know, take care of her and also keep an eye on her baby. But her baby has been removed less than 24 hours after the birth. And um, what had happened is that psychiatry um, has come up with several false claims um, as a reason to remove um, Amethyst Richan from her mother. Um, but that's not it. There were also other outrageous, really extremely outrageous and criminal actions by the hospital. I consider them to be entirely criminal and entirely premeditated. And one such action was, for example, um, the day after this very, very involved and, and um, heavy operation, you know, a cesarean section isn't, um, you know, just a minor thing. So after this heavy operation, which left a huge scar on her, um, on her body, uh, Melanie was uh, put through what I would almost call a CIA style extraordinary rendition to another hospital, which I think actually, um, to be precise, is in itself against her rights because she has the right to always at all times remain in the same hospital as her baby. So I think the law is that she um, is allowed to be separated uh, from her baby. The baby can be in another room. It can be in another part of the building, but she cannot be somewhere else in Brussels. Um, whilst her baby stays at the hospital. And that's precisely what happened. Um, and this was, uh, this extraordinary rendition happened the day after the birth, after I had been removed as a witness from her. Um, and I was asked to leave, even though I was the accompanying person. And um, actually, I had the rights to be with her and support her all throughout the time, 24-7. I was removed, and then this extraordinary rendition followed. Um, it, I think the police came something like half past 10 in the evening, and she was moved to the other hospital at half past 11 in the, um, in the evening. I mean, the, the time of the day is also very, very strange. Um, but then what's extremely, um, I would call it criminal. This is a criminal interrogation. Um, she was interrogated at Hospital Brookman between midnight and 2 a.m. Now, I don't think any sort of in interrogation especially not a, this was meant to be a, an independent so-called independent psychiatric assessment i don't think any psychiatric assessment is worth much when you're you know the day after the operation when you're heavily sedated still from the painkillers and then you're dragged across town somewhere else to be interrogated between midnight and 2 a.m 2 now um 
I don't think this is a medical process at all. It cannot possibly be. I think this is a criminal operation by Belgian intelligence who is known for their utter brutality and sadism, as it has been shown over the last year when I worked with Melanie. I experienced um, their sadism myself. And this is another example. So the hospital claimed that this was some sort of independent psychiatric assessment. However, uh, Melanie called me after the first half of the interview and she told me that the assessment, the opinion of the person she um, talked to, which we still don't know the name of, it was, I think, a, um, you know, a black um, man. Um, he told her after one hour that his opinion was she should be transferred back to hospital Erasmus. Uh, but then he went away, um, talked to some people, and he, when he came back, he said, I'm sorry. There was another one-hour chat between them, and at 2 a.m., Melanie called me again, um, quite panicked from the toilet of Hospital Brookman because they were going to take her mobile phone away, another warfare technique. And she told me um, this man came back and said, um, it has now changed, the plans have changed, and um, I'm now to be transferred back to Hospital Erasmus, but to the psychiatric ward and be locked up there. Now, this is extraordinary. Um, I think um, my way of assessing this case is as follows. Um, there are two hypotheses. Number one is that this is a, a normal medical process um, and everything is in order. And then I would expect you know, to see things that have the hallmarks of a medical process with um, you know, uh, duty of care towards the patient in mind. And then there's another um, hypothesis, which is that this was a malicious and criminal uh, pre-planned operation by Belgian intelligence that was several months in the making and has all the hallmarks of um, psycho psychopathy and utter sadism of the agents written across it. And I have to say the details of the case do not match up at all with the medical um, hypothesis and match up fully with the criminal intel operation. Um, and the features are, for example, these extraordinary renditions, um, uh, the interrogation between midnight and 2 a.m. Um, after that, um, it also, little curious details where um, when I spoke with Melanie, she was still normally dressed, but after the interview, they made her strip naked in front of one of the guards, which was a man, and just stared at her as she had to strip naked. Now, this is uh, sexual humiliation. It's not medical care. This is specific targeted sexual humiliation that, for example, the Nazis engaged in. People might remember that when the victims were marched to the gas chambers, one of the um, first steps was that they were stripped naked and uh, men and women and children together had to be standing in large crowds naked and wait to be um, gassed to death. Now, that's a hallmark of the military and the intelligence agencies. It is this sexual humiliation. So that's another little detail to add into the mix. Um, but then also the fact that the so-called independent psychiatric assessment was overruled by somebody. Now, at that point, they violated their own protocols. So this was, in effect, not independent at all. The decision had already been made, I presume, by Hospital Erasmus all along. And then this was used just as a kind of cover your ass exercise. They pretended to have some uh, psychiatric assessment, but in the end they overruled um, the words of this man. Um, so that's another aspect. But then another aspect which talk, you know, betrays criminality we, and intel. Hmm? Sorry. Can we talk about these two? Can you hold on the third aspect and can we talk about the, these two for a little while? Just the, um, the notion of humiliation that you bring up, which is a very, very important point. It's horrifying. I did not know this detail that there was a guard there who, who, you know, whom she was forced to strip in front of. I did speak about this briefly with Catherine Hine, who, as you know, is an American attorney. She's a non-practicing attorney right now, but she is running this wonderful show called Bedlam in America on WJLARadio.net. And um, one of the things she said in comment to this the fact that she, you know, Melanie was removed of her attire and forced to sleep in this little cell, literally a jail cell. You know, supposedly it was a psychiatric holding place for those who are considered to be in great danger of harming themselves, etc. Uh, but uh, virtually had all of the features of being a jail cell. She said that this is classic degradation technique that they use for prisoners. Anyone who's a criminal, so-called criminal, who's being incarcerated, you know, is being subjected to this kind of extreme degradation. So, as you say, there's both degradation and this aspect of uh, humiliation as well. 
Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, one of the things that should be um, stressed also, these are all these, these little details that um, give away that this was not a medical process. It's also the fact that um, she was denied her painkillers. So the day after a major operation, she was denied her painkillers. That's physical torture. Mm -hmm. um, and then it's, um, the, uh, in the transfer to hospital, Brugman, as you pointed out, she was also after the interview, she was locked not into a hospital bed, this was a holding cell. And I think the intel agencies, and, and personally, I think it's, um, we have to face up to the fact that um, a lot of the um, heads of um, intel and a lot of the senior people in intel who are in charge of training and running these operations are psychopathic degenerates. I think they're sexual sadists and psychopaths. Um, and one of the aspects of um, you know psychopathic serial killers and sadistic degenerates is their sexual arousal upon the psychological and physical torture of a person. And I can see the hallmarks of that all over because, for example, imagine the scene, would you really drag a woman who just had a major operation out of her hospital bed and then lock her in? You also lock it, you know? Her hospital bed in, in uh, Hospital Erasmus did not have a lock on there. Not a single patient is locked in apart from psychiatry upstairs. Mm -hmm. So they locked her in. There wasn't a toilet. And also, would you really put a woman, you know, who just had a major operation onto um, a bed, which is a makeshift bed with these um, straps to hold people down? I mean, I think Intel intended the sight of it and being locked into that room to be psychological torture. Because from a medical point of view, it does not make any sense. No, and as we discussed in a previous conversation, I think, um, these tactics are also intelligence agencies, the classic CIA torture yeah. manual tactics, you know, from the Kubrick, Kubrick manual and the other human resource exploitation training resource manual that they have out there that actually list torture techniques. Exactly. So part of their torture techniques are to degrade the prisoner or the person who's being interrogated to degrade, to, to put down, to humiliate, to subjugate. These are all attempts to subjugate and let the person know from their point of view that the person is worthless and uh, to make him feel him or her feel small and helpless. So they enter into that state of learned helplessness, which they are so fond of. Um, and, you know, the, I would also like to say that the very fact that these events transpired in this hospital at apparently express speed. So the midwife has a conversation with you. The next morning, the midwife uh, projects a whole completely different conversation to the gynecologist. The gynecologist talks to Melanie and says, sorry, we're good. we've heard this concerning stuff. We are very worried about you and we are going to call a psychiatrist to come and assess you. It all happens so quickly, right the next morning. And then the first psychiatrist comes and this literally spends barely 10 minutes and decides that Melanie is delusional. And also chastises Melanie for founding an important human rights organization. And I know we're going to speak at great length about this in just a few minutes, because we need to celebrate Melanie. We need to point out to the world that Melanie is a cutting edge human rights advocate. She is somebody who has put herself on the line for thousands of reporting victims of crime. And for this psychiatrist, this completely uninformed and uneducated psychiatrist, to open her mouth and to, uh, to chastise Melanie and to put her down for starting a human rights organization of this nature is absolutely the heights of ignorance, right? Exactly. It's, it's even arrogance. more than that. Yes. Yeah, ignorant arrogance is what it is, you know. Absolutely. <sighs> I, I would even, I would go as far as saying this is criminal incompetence. And if I may just share my screen, I would like to um, show you who the people are who are involved because oh, really? um, yes. basically yeah. this, this is it. So um, first of all, let's start with the medical care. So when I arrived and I asked um, why Melanie, so, you know, for the people who don't know, Melanie was then separated from her baby um, you know, even the day before the CIA's diet rendition. But when I arrived um, the day after the birth in the afternoon to find out why Melanie was um, separated from her baby, I went to the uh, gynecology unit, uh, so obs um, obstetrics unit, and there I spoke to Dr. or Professor Caroline Delmans here. 
So okay. she's shown on the Hospital Erasmus website. Now, this woman identified herself to me as the head gynecologist. So she was ultimately on that shift in charge of medical, um, the, the medical care of um, Melanie Richon. And was she, she the one, was she the one who met Melanie the next morning and informed her that they were going to give her a psychiatric assessment? Um, I, I think she might have been. I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not sure who that Melanie, precise yeah, person yeah. was. Yeah, we have to check with Melanie. But she is the person who was on shift in the afternoon. And when I asked her why Melanie was separated from her baby, she actually gave me false information. She said Melanie requested mm. to be put into psychiatry. Now this is nonsense. Yes. So I even I even said to her that this is nonsense, and I said, "Look, let's just go and talk to Melanie herself." So I, you know, I marched to Melanie's room, and she came with me. And I said, "Melanie, is this true?" And Melanie said, "No." They coerced me. They told me I either go voluntarily into, um, you know, psychiatric care, and they also wanted to first move her to a hospital called, I think, Saint Anne's. So they, the original plan was even to move um, Melanie and her baby into a psychiatric hospital called St. Anne's. And that's what they were threatening her with. Um, so it was uh, Professor Caroline Delmans who gave me this false and frankly ludicrous information, which she must have known was false, because not a single mother on earth, I don't think, the day after the birth thinks, oh, yes, I'm going to go and tell them I want to be put into psychiatric care instead of just being with my baby. So this is... a bullshit lie as far as I can make out and she must have known it to be to be false I really think so so my but you see, this is, sorry this is the way they are using psychiatry as well Catherine you know because they can't really do many things without the patient's consent they really can't they need consent but you know the way in which they uh, gain consent is coercive so mm -hmm. literally what, what Melanie was subjected to was, as you stated earlier, criminal coercion. Yes, absolutely. I, I think this is, this is really good. And everybody who's listening, um, I also want the, the listeners to know, even if you haven't given birth to a baby and the baby hasn't been taken away, you should still study this case. This is a case study now in criminal intel operations, as far as I can make out. And we will spot the pattern and we will hunt them down on based on other cases as well using this yes, pattern. And I think actually I wanted to finish my thought earlier that I'd started the, the re when you look at the speed at which these events have transpired you know it's not just that you had a conversation and you spilled the beans about implants and foreign technology in her throat etc it appears that everything had been set up and everything started to move at lightning speed and then there was there's also the setup with this Brooklyn hospital this interrogation off-site which certainly has the flavor and nature of a rendition program, the way it was conducted. And then you see the thing that that guy did, that psychiatrist, he first looked at Melanie's evidence and he said immediately, apparently, as soon as confronted with the medical report from a surgeon stating that indeed foreign technology had been removed from Melanie's throat, he immediately said, okay, we need to return you to the maternity ward of Erasmus Hospital. That was his first and accurate medical response to the situation. But look at what transpired. I mean, this is literally like something from a movie. He goes and says, he says, I have to make a couple calls. And then he comes back and says, sorry, the matter is out of my hands. You have to now stay in a jail cell right here. I mean, he didn't use the words jail cell, I'm sure, but he pretty much said, you have to stay here. We're gonna hold you and we are gonna return you to the psychiatric ward, not the maternity ward. Now, clearly something transpired and we need to look at that because who did he speak to? He spoke to a higher authority. Now, who is the higher authority above the independent psychiatrist? Do you think it was Erasme Hospital? I highly doubt it. I think rather the answer that we go to is straight where Catherine has gone to Belgian intelligence. Intel intelligence agencies, secret agencies, these are the ones that are holding power in our countries and our governments and our societies currently. They're the ones calling the shots. They're the ones, you know, constricting communities, uh, wreaking censorship on everybody, forcing people to keep quiet and not speak their minds. We, of course, are category. We're already targeted and therefore we have no qualms about speaking our minds. Um, but the rest of the world around us, in our immediate neighborhoods, in our immediate communities, are not having any rights of free speech currently. You know, they're just doing what they are told. They're all on networks. They're being, um, they're being coached on how to behave toward targeted individuals. 
in their communities. The, the situation is we are living in extreme surveillance and police states. And so you have to ask, who is running it? You know, are the intelligence agencies running it? And if the, and you know, I think, I think at this point we can ask Karen perhaps for her point of view regarding the situation. Who did that psychiatrist do you think? Who did he get those phone calls from? Who was he answering to? Well, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I would say that this very much parallels uh, my experience with NSA when they were trying to get rid of me. Everything was choreographed. I mean, they just basically pushed, 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 pushed until they got the reaction they wanted from you or something near to it or something they could call near to it so that they could go ahead with their little choreographed uh, uh, street theater uh, for me and, uh, and, and push you out no matter what you said or you didn't say, you know. So it's, it rings true. It really is all choreographed and it doesn't really matter what anybody said. They were going to say you said X, Y, Z, and then they, they were going to react to it. And anybody like this independent psychiatrist who called to get uh, a second opinion or, uh, you know, some, uh, some thoughts on protocol was obviously immediately slapped down. You know, it probably was set and was told, you'll do it this way and you'll say this, or you can find another place to work, you know, and we won't be recommending you. So that is probably what happened because you see that, you know, I mean, uh, NSA would uh, go to banks or churches or, or places like that and tell the people how to, how to react to somebody. So it's, it's very typical. I mean, it was set up way before she got there and they intended to take her child for whatever reason. Um, I'm concerned that it was to psychologically harm her, but also the baby. But I too have... I, you know, I don't know that she ever said this, and I think she didn't, but I personally uh, have worries that they might have chipped the baby uh, in places that you can't chip people once they are grown and the, and the uh, bones fuse and harden. So that would be my worry. And uh, I was saying I'm not sure that I would want to do this to a newborn, but I would be so very tempted once I got the baby back to actually have an MRI of it, to make sure that there were not foreign objects in this newborn baby. Um, like I said, Melanie never expressed that type of uh, concern, but frankly, I have it. And I wanted to speak to putting somebody in a psychiatric ward for what their friend or somebody else said. That is just unbelievably ludicrous. And I used the example, I said, with the, with the police, really, when they're functioning correctly. If you call up and say, hey, my neighbor was over on my back deck wearing a tutu and dancing around naked, would the police come and say, okay, off you go. We're taking you to the psychiatric ward. Or would they go next door and maybe see if the neighbor was still dressed in a tutu and naked? That makes a difference. You know, I mean, then you really do have to discern, hmm, do we take the guy who reported it or the guy who is actually doing it. Hmm, what a difficult decision. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I mean, this is what Catherine says. This is typical that they refuse to look at any facts that might uh, change what they're told to do, told to think, and told to say. Just facts have no place in what they have to do. Again, I saw that with uh, NSA. You know, they were going to do what they were going to do. And if they were told to tell you the unicorn's uh, made you do it or, or making them do it, then that's what they told you. You know, it's just mm -hmm. absolutely ludicrous. And uh, I, it dismays me that psychiatrists and some psychologists lie. They basically take their oaths and their training and they use it against people for probably big money. I mean, the, uh, the psychiatrists or the psychologists actually in uh, NSA psych, uh, security psych psychological services were found to be psychologists who had problems. They had had behavioral problems with their real jobs. Okay, the one that uh, basically attacked me was a, uh, <laughs> well, she and a female, another female psychologist were caught sexually compromising each other and using uh, drugs where they were working that were meant for the patients, they were using them to party. 
Now imagine where this woman could get a job. Oh Not very God. many places, except <gasps> NSA. Yay! Wow! All right. <laughs> <That's a bombshell. laughs> That's yeah. incredible. The guy just taking off on the you know deadly pharma drugs that they are trying to prescribe to patients. You know, this is, so this they're, is in the biz, they're in the biz for the drugs. <laughs> that's, a, that, that's a bombshell disclosure from Karen right there, you know. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I, I also think this is a very valid point because, um, you know, when you have a, when you, for example, a, a pedophile or a serial killer, um, sorry, I'm just getting feedback. I'm not sure whose mic it is. Um, so, you know, if you're, if you're a serial killer or a pedophile, the best way to hide is in the police because you are on the other side of the fence, so to speak. So people don't go around rooting for pedophiles and serial killers and the police typically. And I think there's a famous example of that where I think the pedophile expert of the Metropolitan Police London turned out to be a prolific pedophile. And um, sorry, it's not the laughing matter. I just find it hilarious that it took so long to discover this guy. Um, you know, he just knew uh, where to go to look for pedophiles, curi curiously enough. You know, he knew all the places to look for them. He was brilliant. He was one of their best, you know, investigators. And then people twigged that, hang on, he's, you know, he seems to be rather keen on the, you know, research material. But anyway, so it's it's a classic place to hide. And um, if you even think about the two psychiatrists who set up the uh, Guantanamo torture program, I think they are psychopathic degenerates. I think they're sexual sadists and psychopathic degenerates themselves. And the best way they could, um, you know, go and get off was to to work for the CIA as, as uh, you know, psychiatric ex experts or psycho psychologists, you know. And, and um, you know, they, they apparently said to you that this was normal procedure to transport people across town, to call the police, to get the police involved, to drag a patient out of maternity ward. You know, she's just given birth. She's had a C-section. Don't give her painkillers. Yeah, it's a hospital, you know, and we do that often. We get we we engage in brutal traumatic injury and criminal action quite often. It's just normal procedure. <laughs> Somebody had left a comment this, um, underneath that video that, you know, of the webinar that uh, we did with Alfred, you know, where you actually detailed the whole event in detail. Somebody had left a comment over there to state that, you know, this is absolute nonsense. This is not normal process in hospitals. You know, this is not normal at all to take a patient and like take them across town and take them to an independent psychiatric assessment in the middle of the night to interrogate them in that fashion. It is not normal. So... Yeah. Uh, though, and and as you say, those two psychiatrists, or well, I I forget how many actually. It, it appears there were four. I mean, they had a whole gang of psychiatrists. It seems like, you know, this was like um, up on Melanie over here. This whole group of psychiatrists, some of them young, very young, who, as you said, appeared seemed too young to even be to to be believed as having gone through the long process of medical school and then psychiatry training to become a psychiatrist. Um, I know some people made the comment, I think Seven made the comment that perhaps it was another false flag op, that these guys were just players, crisis actors. Yeah. They weren't really psychiatrists. So that's a kind of, that's possibly a thought, you know, to hold in mind and to look into. The, the, these psychiatrists need to be investigated independently, each and every one of them, to find out their background and who they are and who they work, who they have worked for and who they work for currently. Um, because all of them um, sort of switching into action and, and taking Melanie out of there, taking her to this other hospital all of a sudden, and... Um, the other psychiatrist re responding to somebody else, all of it seems to suggest there's somebody beyond the psychiatrist involved. Very much so. And the, the thing that I wanted to bring up was many people frequently say, when such situations are discussed, oh, you're, you're just conspiracy theorists. You're, look, you're uh, making up things, you're manufacturing things, you're fabricating things that are not there. But uh, really, we are not. We are just investigators and we're looking and, and analysts. We are looking very closely at these events as they transpired one after the other and asking very pertinent questions. And one of the most pertinent questions to ask is, who was that psychiatric, who that independent psychiatrist talking to? Who was he talking to? What did he hear? What was he told that he came back from that conversation and completely changed his diagnosis? I, and he sent Melanie back from the maternity ward, from which was his in, immediate intention, 
he sent her back to the psychiatric ward, you know? I, I think you, you uh, this is brilliant. I think you jumped right in at the deep end, Ramola. Um, I think um, what we have to do, uh, and actually, let's start with the disclaimer of conspiracy theory. I mean, number one, that's a CIA term, as we keep pointing out. You know, it was a term devised by the CIA to discredit people who questioned the Kennedy assassination. And I think we have the, the CIA note, um, I forget the number, where they even talk about that term for the very first time. Um, and number two, uh, it's it's uh, there's a very simple scientific way to um, you know to uh, sweep that off the table, which is to say, no, we're not. What we're doing is we're hypothesis checking. So hypothesis testing is the te is the staple of science. You do it every day when you're working as a scientist, and you make if you want to explain a situation, you make several hypotheses and you see which one fits the data the best. And that's exactly, it's kind of a, an A versus B testing in this case. Hypothesis A is this was a medical process. Everything was um, done in good faith with the best um, interests of the patient at heart, with uh, duty of care towards the patient uphold, and people were just following a standard pr procedure and maybe there might have been some misunderstandings. So that's hypothesis A. Um, and there you can check um, very precisely, actually, because what most of these Intel guys don't realize, because they're not data analysts most of the time, um, and most of the time they're not statisticians, uh, and if they are not very good ones, that absolutely every action and every misunderstanding comes with a certain probability. So there, there's a certain probability distribution that guides everything we do in normal life, and that can be measured and it can be assessed. And when we look at the case and we think, oh, that's really fishy, what you're actually doing is internally you're applying probabilities to certain aspects of the um, case. And when too many really unusual probabilities come together, your gut feeling tells you, mm, this just can't be the case. But actually, if you want to formalize it, there's a formal process to map that out, you know? So, for example, if we say, you know, this is a standard procedure and um, it's totally normal to interrogate people at 2 a.m., we can just look at past um, patient data and say, okay, how many people were put through a psychiatric assessment between midnight and 2 a.m.? What is the probability of it coming up? And I think we should find a number that's hopefully, you know, approaching zero or very, very small numbers. Because for one, I'm if you want to get anything done, any sort of medical, you know, um, certificate or any sort of medical process, most of the time you get an appointment during working hours. I mean, very rarely does a hospital give you an MRI between midnight and 2 a.m. So then you can say, what's the probability of a, a medical procedure being done between midnight and 2 a.m.? You know, it, 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 it should be a tiny, tiny fraction. It should be down to emergency procedures. So then we think, okay, let's look at emergency procedures. And let's assume this was an emergency procedure. Well, first of all, an emergency psychiatric assessment. If you're mad, you're permanently mad. It doesn't matter if you get the assessment done at midday or midnight. So why not wait for the next day? Okay. And, and you know, those questions that Melanie was asked during oh, that yes. psychiatric interrogation are also highly interesting. And I would personally like to have a long chat with her and try to find out everything that this guy asked her. Because one of the things that she reported was this guy asked her, uh, so where are you in your mortgage payments now? I mean, give me a break. What on earth does that mean? It sounds so sinister to me. If a psychiatrist is asking you that in the middle of the night, dragging you away from another hospital, intending to psychiatrically commit you to a psychiatric ward, and then he asks you about your mortgage. I mean, what is the, what is the interest there? What does the interest there suggest? Is he trying to commit her for life and take her house? Is that the, the implication here? I'm sorry, my mind kind of rushes to that. But my question is, like, why would he ask such a question? Oh, that's a very good point, Ramola. Exactly. So this is one of the questions she was asked at Hospital Brookman. Where are you um, in the uh, repayments of your home? Very good question. And now, now we can do the A versus B hypothesis testing. Would a doctor who is most concerned in trying to find out your mental state towards you, know, you towards your, your, the, your care, towards your baby, or would it more fit a mafia boss trying to get his grubby hands on your flat? And the, the key issue is that if you've paid off the flat, you can be blackmailed and um, this flat can be um, misappropriated. If you haven't paid off your mortgage, most people don't realize, but your flat is owned by the bank. So what the psychiatrist seems to assess is 
how easy is it to, to rob your or to, to, you know, misappropriate your flat? If it's paid off and it belongs to you, well, we just would have to rob a single lady. Otherwise, we'd have to rob a bank. You know, <laughs> that's the deal, you know. So is that a medical question or is it a mafia question? Mm, <laughs> I go for mafia. <laughs> you know, vote. <laughs> thanks for bringing up that word, because this certainly sounds like a mafia operation. And many people have made the comment that, you know, this is a Masonic operation, that this is a Masonic. And we know when we when we use the word Masonic, that's connected to mafia in the sense of Masonist mafia. Right. So there are Masonic hospitals. There are Masonic networks. There are little Masonic little boy clubs, old boy networks holding hands with each other and doing evil deeds, you know and um, egging each other on and concealing each other's crimes. And we know that these creeps infest our police services. Uh, they infest our secret agencies, our intelligence agencies. They're in the military. You know, so people making the comment that this is a Masonic hospital is not that far off the mark. So I'm glad you brought up the word mafia. We are, it sounds very much like we are dealing with a cutthroat mafia here, which is associated with intelligence. Oh, absolutely. And actually, um, now that we're on this topic, just as a brief sideline into Mafia, Masonic and Intel, um, it, I think you can use systems analysis to prove and then you can look through the historical records, I'm sure. And I'm pretty sure you can prove that um, the entire Freemason movement is a front for the Mafia. It's a front for organized crime that is trying to spread influence into nation states and, and actually um, undermine the power, originally the power of the of royalty, I think. Um, but that aside, um, you can use systems analysis and say that even if it weren't um, set up as a front by the Mafia, with time it would have been um, infiltrated by the Mafia, or by organized crime rather. And uh, the same is also true of the intelligence agency. So it's curious, but um, the intelligence agencies, in, as they were originally, you know, labeled or, you know, pretended to be designed for, they have a duty to infiltrate organized crime. Organized crime would have a massive interest in reverse infiltrating the intelligence agency. So you, when, when you have this, you know, a, a system pressure towards cross infiltration from both sides, what you'll end up with is a fused symbiotic relationship, one system. So I think it's fair to say that now after, you know, having had intelligence agencies for for several hundred years, um, they and organized crime must be synonymous based on the rules of systems physics. Um, and the same will be also true of the Masonic networks because of infiltration. So uh, it's my personal opinion as a systems analyst that by now today we can say that actually the intelligence agencies, organized crime and the Masonic networks are different aspects of the same organized crime unit. And then we can look at, um, you know, how they act and we can use something that um, by, um, oh, his name was Christopher Story. Um, he was um, an editor and so on, very good in, in current affairs and he called it the duck test. So if it quacks like a duck, if it looks like a duck, you know, if it walks like a duck, it must be a duck. So if it quacks like, um, you know, organized crime, if it moves like organized crime, and if it looks like organized crime, it must be organized crime, right? Mm -hmm. So um, again, here we can look at this, what happened at Hospital Erasmus and say, does it look like, um, you know, a medical process or does it look like an intel slash mafia process, organized crime process? And suddenly, as soon as you bring in organized crime, you know, and, and the intelligence agencies being a front for organized crime, suddenly a, a lot of things make sense because suddenly you understand the link between um, the secret services and child trafficking, the secret services and drug running and arms trading. Suddenly it all makes sense. And furthermore, the mafia fam famously has something called omerta. So omerta is a, is a vow of silence. Uh, and I would, uh, you know, humbly submit that Omerta is identical with, in English, it would be called the Official Secrets Act. You know, you bind people to utter silence and you put them under pressure to remain silent even when they're witnessing crimes. And I think this is what's happening certainly with MI5 and the European intelligence agencies. They are under Omerta. You know, the official secrets acts and their, you know, local equivalents are Omerta, basically. So I think you're totally right. This maps one to one, you know, into this. 
And and as for silence, you know, I should also report that I called the hospital this morning, Erasmi Hospital. I spoke to the press office, um, to a woman who will refuse to give me her name. She said she wasn't Sophie Coppins, the director of communications, but that Sophie Coppins had left and she was the new director of communications. So perhaps we can find her name. But uh, what she what she said to me was, um, you know, because I explained that I was here to, to report on this story and to find out more about Amethyst Richin and what the status was and what the hospital could tell me about why they were keeping this child for 30 days, despite the fact that the mother was... Um, released from the hospital. She refused to comment and she said, um, oh, we are not allowed to say anything to the press about patients. So, you know, I kind of pushed it, but I could not get past that barrier. She went on and on about how they were not allowed to speak to the press about patients and about the, about patient affairs. But I tried to say, but this is about a baby. This is an international case at this point. This is already in the news. Um, well, she refused to budge, so we exchanged cordialities and wished each other a good morning. Um, <laughs> but um, that's that's the status. I could not find anything out from her. But as you know, well, Melanie has shared with us that the youth aide who has set up a, uh, an appointment with her um, for the 6th of November, which is a whole week away, has said to her that they were concerned for the future of the child. In other words, it sounds to me, from everything I'm hearing, that um, this youth aid and this youth court, in conjunction with the Rasme Hospital, is indeed still working on this plan or the strategy to really hold the baby to, indefinitely and to keep the baby indefinitely from the mother. And what they are targeting is Melanie's work. Based on Melanie's work and what she's doing and the fact that she's working at the head of a human rights organization that's listening to reports of people who have been covertly implanted and who are reporting being hit with electromagnetic radiation weapons, which as we know, governments are most certainly doing, using all around the world. Um, that they said is very concerning to them because to them, you know, so they're taking this line, and this is what we need to analyze. They're taking this line, this tack, that to speak about such things, to presume that people are being covertly implanted, etc., is delusionary, is delusional, and um, uh, smacks of delirium. And therefore, a mother who is focused on such ideas is rather dangerous to the world at large, is not normal in our normal society, and needs to be kept far away from her baby. So you see, that's the tack that they are taking. And it's very, very concerning. But this, I think, is the heart of the problem. So I think that's where we need to go in our understanding, here, in our analysis. What exactly are they trying to do? And how exactly can we combat this? I think, um, actually, uh, today we're delving into so many tentacles of this octopus. Um, you know, I, I think you're very, very astute that you're bringing up the importance of um, the family um, tribunal, the family courts, and these youth tribunals and youth, uh, what's it called, social services. Because um, I think what we will discover is that um, as we're mapping out this organized crime cartel, is that uh, they have been uh, deep captured and they have been made to be conduits um, to harvest babies from their parents and children and feed them to the human trafficking and uh, pedophile networks. I think, I think, you know, to jump the gun and come to the conclusion, I think this is what we'll find. Um, and I say that because the cases that fit this pattern from everywhere around the world are just so strikingly similar that there seems to be, um, you know, a, a pattern behind it. And also if you, if you just, um, you know, analyze it using systems analysis and come to the conclusion that the intel agencies might be just synonymous with organized crime. This is precisely what you would expect. The intelligence agencies then infiltrating the court system, the police system, the, and then also uh, once you do that, you can, um, and if your business is human trafficking and running pedophile rings, then it would make sense for you to set up those courts to be harvesting operations, to take children away. So I think this is under the, the general, you know, um, view that we should analyze this. And, and as always, you can't, um, even if this is the case, you can't say, okay, all judges must therefore be criminals and must be in with the pedophile network. No, it's always to think which judge 
might be compromised and which judge is still, um, you know, completely, um, you know, um, uh, has uh, um, integrity preserved. But I think this is this is very very important. And I have to say, um, you know, as regards the the youth courts, there are also irregularities I've already observed. Um, for example, with Melanie's case, um, irregularities um, can be things like they don't stick to protocol or they funnily bend protocol, use semantics to really twist things, or another aspect is also delaying decisions and delaying actions, you know, playing on time. And I have seen this from the um, youth court as far as I've been aware. They, um, you know, they gave Melanie an appointment that was very late. And when you're dealing with a baby that has been removed from its mother straight after birth, it time is of essence because there's something called um, attachment. Um, and it's, it's to do with the bonding between mother and child, but it's actually also known to be um, in, integrally important to the mental health of the child up to the point where you um if you traumatize a child and and um break the development of attachment you essentially create a psychopath uh you know you create somebody who is ruthless thinks totally independently doesn't expect any help from anybody because they never actually got it so the brain circuitry never um, set up to expect you know any sort of warmness and kindness from another person but they will also act accordingly towards others so you will create um with a fairly increased probability a sociopath and a psychopath which uh based on the mk ultra program is precisely what the intelligence agencies seem to have been wanting to do for a very long time and funnily enough is exactly what would benefit organized crime because psychopaths you know are they're wonderful uh, little workers you know to do their dirty work so I found it shocking that the youth court would be delaying time and not giving Melanie an appointment. And all sorts of excuses were made that the person who could be dealing with her case was on holiday because currently there are school holidays in Belgium. And then also things like, oh, yes, but I can't give it to a colleague because only I'm in charge of the case. This is all nonsense, you know. I, but this is part of, uh, you know, um, yes, this entire thing. And it really seems the way this youth court is behaving that they appear to have every intention of, you know, keeping the baby and holding the baby. They don't care about the mother's desire to see the child. They don't care about bonding or attachment, or at least they are projecting that they are not caring, you know, which is outrageous, which is outrageous. We shouldn't stand for this in our societies because that's what it is. Here we have doctors who are not acting like doctors interested in health care of the patient, you know, subjecting Melanie to such trauma, calling in a psychiatrist the day after the baby is born. We have psychiatrists who are supposedly interested, who should be interested in the mental health of their patients. No, not at all acting like, like doctors or people who are healthcare professionals. They basically were acting like armed guards, you know, who had an opportunity to incarcerate a person and use that opportunity and that power. So the great power of psychiatry cannot be underestimated. The situation has now been set for psychiatrists to wreak great power on people. And so many people are coming forward now to report that this kind of thing that's happened to Melanie has happened to them as well. And, you know, I, for one, am certainly very interested in exploring the subject, and I will, in the days to come, continue to talk to people and um, keep my spotlight, keep my focus very firmly on psychiatry. And I know Millicent is also very interested in working with me on this, and we are going to work together um, to, to really expose psychiatry, because psychiatry needs to be exposed once and for all. I know there are other people doing it as well, so, you know, join hands with them join hands with those who are shining a spotlight on psychiatry. We need to ask some very hard questions of psychiatrists. We need to ask some very hard questions of doctors. And uh, because clearly the, this whole psychiatry setup is being supported by the intelligence establishment, when the real question should be, why should it be? Why should psychiatrists, you know, work for the state? Why should they um, answer to the state? Why should they act like armed guards? You know, they went to medical school. They either stay within the field of medical care or they, or they clear out of hospitals and we dissolve psychiatry as a society. Why should we pay any attention to psychiatrists as a society? You know, they, they seem to be destroying societies and destroying people's lives. So that's one big aspect of it, I think. Uh, actually... I think this is this is very good. I would just would like to add the one sentence that a psychiatrist who doesn't behave um, like a doctor and puts the interests of the intelligent or the secret service above uh, the medical uh, interests of the patient is not a doctor. He's an agent, first and foremost. 
So then the question is, do we really want to have agents running our hospitals? You know, agents who might have, you know, gotten degrees in medicine or psychiatry, but first and foremost, they are agents. I think this is what it comes down to, you know, and I, I really loved your list of all the people who are involved in this debacle and need to be um, investigated closely. And I think we should keep this list in mind. So number one, you know, psychiatry, doctors, um, but also I would also add the courts, the courts, the youth courts, the family courts, and then of course the um, intelligence community, which I submit had its hand involved absolutely everywhere. But on the topic of the courts, which we'll also go into great detail, it, it just occurred to me, and I would like to share my screen and point people um, to a speech. And um, this is a speech um, I, um, that you can find. Uh, I'll, I'll show you how you can find this. Because um, I would like to make a broader point. Number one to realize is that the problems we're dealing with are not uh, confined to Brussels or Belgium. They are global. So that's assumption number one, and I, I will you know, try to prove it to you. Um, but also that there, there are people who have already noticed that something is up, and they are in all parts of these professions that we just listed. And I would like to point you to a speech that you can find on the website of the Supreme Court um, in the UK. So if you go to www.supremecourt.uk, you'll get there. And um, uh, actually, now that I see this, may I just point out something that just occurred to me? If you look at the logo of the Supreme Court, you will see a big omega. And then you will see three flowers that are arranged in the pattern of six 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 can you see this so there seems to be some sort of it's i think it's meant to represent uh wales england and uh, uh, uh scotland i think so the three parts of the uk uh but the question is where's ireland uh, maybe that's one of these leaves i i don't know uh so anyway so you have the 666 pattern and the omega and the omega is also used by uh you know the vatican otherwise known as the mafia um and, uh, you know, I am Alpha and Omega is, is something that's, uh, you know, attributed to God, but uh, the people who represent God on earth sometimes like, you know, to um, take this attribute and apply it to themselves. Um, so actually, Omega is also uh, a symbol for the mafia. Uh, so just as an aside, and then, of course, the Crown Corporation, I've mentioned the Crown Corporation, right? And its importance in London and in the, uh, what's it called, the... Um, uh, uh, the, the City of London Corporation, okay, so in the, in the judiciary. So anyway, this is, this is kind of an ominous logo. I'm not sure if the Supreme Court judges, uh, you know, actually understand what's printed here everywhere. But anyway, that aside, let's see if apart from this strange logo, which is a bit scary, maybe we can find something useful. So if you go to news and publications, you can go to a place called Speeches. Okay, and here you can find the speeches given by the Supreme Court judges. And this is very important because Supreme Court judges in the UK have a voice that's listened to. Uh, they might not sometimes feel that, but I certainly listen to them many times. And I'm not even in, uh, you know, in, in the field of law. Um, and if you go through, you can, you can find them give opinions about various um, important topics of the day. For example, access to justice here by Lord Newberger on the 3rd of July, 2017. Uh, the plight of the unmarried, uh, many, many, many other things. Um, but then also, if you go down, you can find, um, if you search for um, Lord Sumption, one of the uh, Supreme Court judges, you will find a speech given by him on the 8th of June last year, and it says family law at a distance. Now, this is a short speech, six pages long, and I invite you to read it, and especially read it once, and then read it again, and the second time around, read between the lines. Because when I read it, I detected, it's written in a very polite, non-confrontational way, as the Supreme Court judges have to write, but I detected a whiff of dissatisfaction with family law uh, as compared to other parts of the law. It, it kind of sounded to me, and please read it and check if you get the same impression, it sounded to me like um, family law was kind of a law unto itself, maybe, um, and that 
some judges found it a bit odd that it would be like that. And here, I think Lord Sumption talks about the fact that, um, you know, even though he hasn't practiced in family law, I think he's a commercial lawyer himself. Um, you know, he says inexperience is not always a handicap. And then he goes on about how, you know, sometimes cross pollination between parts of the law is a good thing because, you know, it helps you to kind of see sense and compare, you know, apples to pears and actually still makes sense. Anyway, this speech is actually very important, which is why I bang on about it, but I can't say very much about it because I don't want to bias um, people's view on reading this. I think you should just go and read this speech yourself and try to think about the importance. Um, so if I'm right in my assumption and um, what this speech implies is a kind of dissatisfaction with family law that's even noticed by Supreme Court judges, could it possibly be, and this is now me speaking, this is not in the speech of Lord Sumption, um, could it possibly be that family law has kind of become a creature, um, you know, of its own and it's kind of going on in often an odd direction that maybe some judges find worrying and could that possibly be a sign for deep capture of the family law and the family law courts by maybe organized crime and the intel agencies possibly running pedophile rings and using children taken away from their parents to feed into the pedophile and human trafficking and even human sacrifice business that's run by organized crime well, so that's what, that's what got myron may killed in florida his efforts to free a woman's uh, child from the pedophile ring in Tallahassee, Florida. That's the, that's the truth behind why he uh, was harassed and pushed over the edge. And the police were oh so glad to shoot him. Exactly. Yes, um, Karen, we very, really do a podcast very, good very soon on that subject. On Myron May and the pedophile ring. So it's very important, as you said, Catherine, that whole to, to um, bring up the context. We're talking about pedophile rings. We're talking about Brussels, which I think has been in the news for being at the center of various pedophile rings and child trafficking rackets. Um, there are many places in the world that we are learning that are engaging in this kind of stealing of children through the family court system and uh, pushing them into the, the, the underground crime network, which is trafficking children for various purposes, you know, for use in various nefarious scenarios, child pornography, child abuse, child trafficking, Satanism, you know, their, their ritual sacrifices. You see, these are very, very hard truths that in the past have been condemned and uh, written out of our realities by those very CIA terminologies of conspiracy theory and fringe information. You know, the word fringe is something that mainstream media uh, pops out every now and then to condemn anything that um, they don't want covered, that they don't want, you know, seeing the light of day. And now we know that mainstream media in itself is part of this organized crime racket, right? It's part of Operation Mockingbird. It's part of what the CIA controls, etc. So, it, this it, is this is a very good point. Sorry, Rumble, I have to jump in because I, I it's the first time I hear the, you know the word fringe information, but I can see that just, just like fake news is one of the it's it's so beautifully media, doesn't it? It's like a it, isn't it? It's it's just a, a it word. Is. The word fringe. It, the word fringe is is a kind of a word of denigration that you know mm -hmm. so-called journalists in mainstream media will level at alternative media journalists like myself, you know that I'm putting out fringe information, that I'm a fringe, that I'm on the fringe here, because it's so very fringe. I'll tell you, I've actually had occasions where after I've published articles, I've gone to the library, you know, Milton Library, and I've had uh, people literally putting um, fringe, you know, like a shawl with a fringe around me, and a woman sitting over there and having a conversation with her friend talking about fringe information out there and g giving me sharp looks. So I'm supposed to, you know, sort of take this covert communication because this is all they can do. This is how the intel agencies operate, as you know. They can only engage in covert communications because they've built up the stupid world of secrecy for themselves, you see? <laughs> they can't stand people like me sort of just putting it out there. So 
I, I think by now, you know, I, I think if you get a, you know, you, you, you have probably intel agents marrying other intel agents, like, you know, you have doctors marrying other doctors. And that, do they communicate by a covert, you know, signaling, you know, they leave covert little leaflets of, can you buy some milk on the way home? I mean, that's <laughs> a good question. question. By the way, on that subject, I should, I should actually present a little anecdote about classified information that I read about in a Democracy Now! interview, I think, that John Kiriakou whom, as you know, is ex-CIA whistleblower. Well, he may still be working for the CIA. They all do, right? Um, but he made this comment to Amy Goodman, I think, that, oh, you know, classified, well, it's a big joke inside the CIA. You know, we classify everything. You know, for instance, so he met his wife, apparently, so she's also CIA. He met his wife at the CIA. And uh, to ask her out for lunch, you know, he'd classify his little note. He'd send an email to her saying, hey, what about lunch? And, you know, it would be classified. And she would get the email and she would say, okay. And she would classify the email and send it back to him. Oh, I saw that at NSA too. Yeah. And you saw that at NSA too. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. So you see to us on the outside here, you know, outside these, you know, deadly secret intelligence agencies with their little boxes and compartments and little secret labels and above top secret clearances and whatnot. It's vastly interesting to know that this term classify is actually a big joke in a certain way. You know, it's kind of used, it's used, it's used and exploited, you know, so well, you, let me tell you a very quick anecdote um, concerning a woman I knew at NSA, and it's not a funny anecdote. She uh, apparently had problems with a contractor she was working with. And to get back at her, uh, she, was, she and he were working in an office in the basement of NSA. And uh, to get back at her, he actually physically attacked her. He raped her. And then when she tried to go to the police, the Anne Arundel police, because um, that was the proper police to go to. NSA said, no, you can't report the crime because he's a, class he's a contractor and his name is classified as to working with us. So no, we're not going to allow you to report the crime. Well, she was several weeks pregnant and she lost the baby. Oh no. So NSA forbade her to report the crime. They wouldn't cooperate when the police, she reported it anyway. But when the Anne Arundel police came to NSA and said, we'd like the name of the man, they said, no, we're not going to give it to you. So the investigation was dead in the water, and that was it for her. Oh, you know what, Terry? Exactly. That's another... They re retaliated against her for yeah, reporting that's it. A ter and, right, and that's a terrific example of how NSA is using its power, misusing its power, right? Yeah. That's an abuse of power. I, oh, I yeah. have two thoughts, immediate thoughts, ladies. Number one, for this, for this woman... I mean, you know, it, it, because this is a program by NSA, it's, it, and they've done it probably to many, many people, um, I think it's classified as crime against humanity because it's a, such a big program. It's not just her individual case. Now, that doesn't have a, um, a limitation period. Therefore, we can always, we still have time to get back at NSA for that. And then we can use what you always say, Karen, that you can't use classification to cover crime, to cover up crime. And this is a, a staple example of exactly that. So that's point number one. We will get back at these bastards for exactly that and we'll dig out the person at NSA who forbade the investigation. You know, I mean, it's the NSA. Why can't they investigate what's going on in their own basement, for God's sake? You know, I mean, that's another thing. They have a duty to um, stop terrorism and crime. So, you know, two ways to get back at them. But also it occurs to me that does this mean we can just go and shoot anybody at NSA and then no one can report it because the name of the victim would be classified? Could, could you, you just would extrapolate to that. Yeah, you could extrapolate to that. It's just lunacy. Yeah, Absolute Karen, lunacy. I mean... I, it occurs to me, Karen, that if you went and um, you killed, what's his name, you know, Black Jr., uh, could you, I mean, both you were at NSA and, you know, the issues that led up to maybe the shooting would be to do with NSA, would be classified and, you know, he, his name would be still, you know, maybe classified or shoot maybe somebody else who's not as widely known. I mean, can you just use that to just have a, you know, a kind of a, killing spree and no one is allowed to investigate the crime because it involves NSA personnel and contractors. <laughs> yeah. And when you take an example that's ridiculous and you extrapolate, you know, and it becomes even more lunatic, then you know, the principle is wrong, you know? So this is a very obviously, I mean, if he had shot me, then yes, they would apply that you know, vice versa. No, then I would be arrested and gone for the rest of my life. So, you know, it's, uh, again, you're talking about a captured system where they apply law the way they want to.
you know, they pervert it the way they want to. And you see that in law enforcement who's, who are being influenced by these very same people, mm -hmm. you know. They're using the law selectively. Exactly. And they're using it to cover up their own criminality. You know, I think oh, that, yeah. that's a case that really demonstrates that. And right. that, in a sense, is what the intelligence agencies are using psychiatry for. Absolutely. Well, there's a big trend in the federal government because, you know, with the, the, with the concern that all of the whistleblower protection laws were basically being scoffed at, you know, and they were being broken right and left. You know, you report something and then suddenly your five-star performance drops to two, you know, and yet your work hasn't changed whatsoever, but your, your uh, supervisor is advised to downgrade your work. I know that happened to me. You know, and um, she apologized. She said, I can't, I can't do anything about it. You know, I've given you this. And then I was told by branch management to downgrade it. And that was just before, basically, they were trying to uh, get rid of me. It was um, probably a few weeks before they really went into high gear to, to push me out. Um, and nobody had ever downgraded my work before. You know, I had many... Uh, awards and things like that that are very obvious. You can just look up and see who, who's gotten monetary awards or other types of awards for the work. And that made no sense whatsoever. But throughout the government, they have been using psychiatric reprisal, you know, to get around these laws. And they most especially kicked off into high gear when Congress said, okay, we're getting all these reports that everybody's ignoring these laws. So we're creating something called the No Fear Act which guarantees that you can go to the IG or the EEO and not have reprisal against you. In fact, they made it so clear. They said, we're going to make and mandate this law be taught to every single employee in every single agency yearly. Class and sign off that you, yes, you have been taught this and you know that this is right. And so this kicked off certain agencies into the a uh, wildly elaborate psychiatric retribution. And that's what, that's what got me out, was that uh, they basically couldn't find anything, you know, to, to do to me for my work or anything else. And so they had to totally fabricate it. And of course, it is a, you know, psychological attack. And they ignore such inconvenient things as uh, somebody never testing abnormally on a psychiatric test and their own uh, psychiatrist or independent psychologist saying, no, there's nothing wrong with this person. They're like, well, but we so, we so say there is, so bye-bye, you're out. You know, total, yeah. total ignoring, uh, the total ignoring of any and all facts is, as Catherine says, typical of a captured system. And that's what we have. Mm -hmm. you know, and you know, there's a very deliberate, intentional kind of no. action here in striving, despite the fact that you've gotten great psychiatric assessments outside or psychological assessments outside, but they're still striving to kind of ram you with that label, you know, mm -hmm. the mentally ill label. And that's what we need to really expose and challenge, I think, in our societies today. Because for too long, this has been going on. And it's come to a situation now where people are simply being, their lives are being destroyed through the use of psychiatry and psychiatrists and psychologists. They all see psychologists, don't they, at the NSA? Mm, yes, they, these people are mostly psychologists, behavioral psychologists. Um, and I would, I would agree with the fact that most likely the one who attacked me was indeed a sociopath or a psychopath. And that is a wonderful place to hide if you are a psychopath, because... You know, growing up, I'm sure that her parents reprimanded her over and over again for doing whatever bizarre things. So she learned that, oh, you can't do this overtly or you will be uh, taken to task for it. So it probably occurred to her, if I learn about this, then I can hide behind it and I, then I can do what I want. Because my impression of her is, yes, she is a sociopath or worse, a psychopath. And uh, there seemed to have been three at NSA that were particularly vicious and did have no qualms whatsoever about lying to people or threatening them. And that's just not really what a psychologist should be. I, I think this is, this is fantastic because now as I'm hearing all this and as I'm considering the case of Melanie, I am really thinking, okay, how are we going to um, repair all this? How are we going to recapture the system? And what principles can we use? Um, 
And everything we said, I think um, it fits 100% with Melanie's case and it fits with, um, it, because it seems to be a staple strategy by the intelligence agencies, it must fit hundreds and thousands of other intel crimes. So I'm thinking if we can figure out this one, we can figure out a large fraction of them and take them to court and slowly, I'm all about recapturing the system. And by the way, Karen, it just occurred to me that if they, if they did that to this woman who got raped, they must have set a precedent. So can we recapture the system? And once you're back at NSA, you know, we kill all these bastards. <laughs> and then we change the law <laughs> to make it more sane. You think there a precedent? I, I don't know. Maybe something to keep in mind. Anyway, just aside, uh, one of the things I would like to say about psychiatry, um, Number one is a physicist, arrogant particle physicist. For me, psychiatry and psychology, because I've never actually, I'm sure that there are scientifically sound aspects of it, but the large part of it is just pseudoscience. It's pseudoscientific. They just make it up as they go along. And there are certain um, aspects you can use from other fields of science and mathematics and statistics and systems analysis and normal physics and actually disprove um, what they're saying. And then the question is, can you apply principles from other fields to a case? And um, actually, in, in science and in physics, you can. You know, you can use, if you spot the pattern and the dynamics, um, the laws that you derive from that will apply to any other case where the same pattern and the same dynamics applies. So that's physics. But there's also one from the social sciences. For example, if I may just briefly go back to that speech, that uh, by law assumption that I've brought up. I brought it up because it has such important aspects and also everything said by a Supreme Court judge, for better or for worse, carries a lot of weight. So quoting it is uh, a good idea, especially in the court of law. And one of the things he says, uh, okay, this is not one of his, uh, you know, dicta, it's kind of um, a speech, but um, still, it's the same man and his brain didn't just stop working. So what he says should make sense. Um, so he says, um, He's talking about specialist opinions, for example, things like, you know, psychiatrists and psychologists used um, for the family courts. And he talks about the weight of a specialist opinion. And he says there'll usually be at least one specialist on the appeal panel, both in the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court. But his or her voice will not necessarily be decisive. The proposition has to run the gauntlet of external scrutiny. This permits a measure of cross fertilization. Uh, between different areas of law, which for my part, I think profoundly healthy. Okay, so you kind of get the, the drift of what he's talking about, even though we haven't gone through the details of the speech. Now, I want to take these words and actually put them into the context of um, system physics. And that is, um, when you have specialist opinion, okay, um, or specialist information, it doesn't mean that only a specialist can assess the value and the truthfulness of that information. It might be the case that only a specialist knows about that bit of information or knows its true importance, but he has to be able to explain it to others and other people need to be able to assess it. Now, this is a principle that's um, you know, very widely known in physics. For example, I'm a particle physicist, not a nuclear or atomic physicist. Nevertheless, I taught um, nuclear physics um, at Hartford College, and that's because the principles that are outlined in nuclear physics, I can assess with the same toolkit, with the same laws of physics, okay? So using the laws of physics and mathematics and logic, we can, um, we should be able to assess anybody's words. But then also, um, Lord Sumption talks about um, a measure of cross-fertilization be, uh, between different areas of law uh, being profoundly healthy. Um, I would like to expand this uh, to a broader point using system physics and say, that uh, what he calls cross-fertilization, I would call cross-calibration in system physics. So um, if you cross-calibrate a system ac across its different parts, you make sure that you, know, um, you don't end up in, in just local nonsense and local minima that make maybe local sense, but globally don't make any sense. So I would say that what he um, is um, saying here is actually a much broader point. So you have to have cross-fertilization or cross-calibration between different areas, not just of law, but also different a areas of medicine, and different areas of science, okay? So uh, using that little um, discourse, um, I think this is a much broader principle that we can apply against these psychiatrists and say, 
I'm sorry if you guys come up with a so-called expert opinion, it doesn't mean that the rest of us can't assess the truthfulness and validity of that expert opinion. So I, as a particle physicist, can come along and I can listen to your argument as much as a judge who is not a psychiatrist nor a particle physicist can come along and assess the words of a psychiatrist and a particle physicist and um, you know, try to gauge the truthfulness. It might be hard, you know, a judge would have to know the laws of physics, so I would have to explain it to them to assess the truthfulness, I would say, within particle mm -hmm. physics, but I should be able to do that, okay? It's actually one of the fundamental principles of physics that anybody should be able to check the laws of physics wherever they are in the universe. So, this is important because when these psychiatrists come along and say, oh, Melanie Richan or Karen Stewart, she just went spontaneously mad and went so incredibly insane that we had to separate her from her baby. We can come along and we can say, hang on a second, uh, Karen Stewart, for example, she went all throughout her career at NSA producing stellar work that won prizes. And then suddenly there meant to be a break and a total you know, uh, mental breakdown. And now, and then, it just applies to the time that she was um, having these altercations with NSA. And now that she's on the Techno Crime Fighters Forum, you know, member of JIT, she makes perfect sense and is producing excellent analyses again. So there must have been a break. And I'm sorry, in nature, one of the fundamental principles is that there are no step functions in nature. There are no step functions in nature. Step functions are instantaneous changes that just go bam. They just don't exist. They have a turn on curve and a turn off curve, you know, so. We should also keep in mind, however, that that's an excellent analysis. And I think that's a very opposite point to bring up, Catherine. I think we should certainly use that. Um, the other aspect of that, however, is that, you know, I think their old argument to say that Melanie was mentally ill was this whole midwife conversation that they were attributing to her, voices in her head that they were attributing to her talking about, which she never talked about and you never talked about, etc. You know, some fabrications, fabrications of information. Scripted. Uh, scripted fabrications that were used to, to come up with the step function, sudden dilution kind of story. So that's one aspect. The other aspect is that right now with the baby in the hospital and all the indications that we are getting that they are trying their best to hold on to that child and possibly completely remove the child from Melanie. I think that is, and that is being related to Melanie's work, you know, trying to convey to her that you're doing this strange work, you have this organization, you must be fringe, etc. You know, you're clearly delusional. So you see, that's a different story. And I think that's something that which we should really spend some time on to talk about Melanie's work, the greatness of her work, the absolute necessity and essential quality of her work, you know, the great service to humanity that Melanie and her organization are providing. And we need to reframe the terms in which these psychiatrists are trying and psychiatrists and these court people, the family court people, the court aide, I think, gave her that comment, are trying to frame her as still delusional by reason of the work that she is doing. So we need to look at the work that she is doing as well. I, I completely agree, actually. And, and again, we should contrast it. We should use this you know, cross-calibration and contrast one with the other because Melanie has... You know, I've worked with her for over a year very closely. I've spoken to her almost daily sometimes. And um, everything work was always of the highest quality, you know, all throughout this. Oh, sorry. I think I'm getting feedback um, from Karen's microphone. Karen, can you just mute your microphone? Um, and, and in contrast, so this is Melanie. She is actually, which I think um, Hospital Erasmus didn't cotton on to this. And I think this is what's going to burn their little mittens is they didn't realize that Melanie is an internationally recognized human rights campaigner and human rights activist. She is standing up against crime, against the torture and mutilation and the um, robotization of living beings. Now, her human rights organization, because it's preparing court cases and is actively finding evidence, is actually at the vanguard of this. She is at the forefront because we know that even large human rights organizations do not have um, the daring or whatever, or just the integrity to, uh, to actually support um, the victims of the intelligence agencies and the victims of neurotech and implantation. So she is doing the work. 
the integrity, the spine, the courage, and also the separation, because if, it seems to me from all reports, it's many of the big hum human rights organizations, including ACLU, Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch, ha do indeed have connections to the intelligence agencies. And so they're not going to, you know, go out of their way to expose the intelligence agencies. They're being paid by them, or they're working with them. There's some kind of strange collusion. Yeah, absolutely. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, years ago, uh, in 2009, when I was getting fired for nothing, uh, I attempted to get the ACLU involved, and I was told that they don't really do much in Maryland because of NSA stalking and harassing them. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and this Karen, was the that's same another bombshell announcement. That's very interesting. Uh, let's let's uh, really broadcast that for the entire world to hear. So ACLU in Maryland kind of let you know that they really were afraid to get involved because um, they, they couldn't they been... investigate cases of NSA stalking because NSA was stalking them. Right, to make sure that they didn't investigate cases of stalking. So I was also told by Siobhan Gorman, who had worked for the Wall Street Journal in Washington, that my story, I was trying to speak to her about this, and she said, this is really astonishing that so very many people have almost exactly the same story about NSA security stalking and harassing them to include journalists. So she yeah. confirmed to me in writing in an email that NSA stalked and harassed journalists. And this is why journalists and mainstream media do not want to touch stories of targeting do not want to touch stories of organized stalking or about reports of electromagnetic radiation weapons being used on people. They know very well it's going on and they are just afraid to touch it. You know, right. so that's a very important point to underline. Thank you for giving us that information. I can tell you that I've spoken to activists, you know, in other fields, in the environmental field and so forth, who've also told me that there are many activists, hundreds of activists all around the country, all around the world who are being hit in this fashion with electromagnetic weapons. So they're trying to keep it quiet because, you know, but they're still soldiering on. These are the real hardcore truth tellers and real uh, workers for society and working people working in the service of humanity who are being targeted in this fashion. And um, they're still proceeding, but, you know, they don't go around calling themselves targeted individuals, etc. As some people do. I know you and I and the rest of us, we don't favor that term, but we understand that that term has come to be used now. And there are so many connotations associated with that term, and it's good to be aware of them. Um, but people are being targeted. People are being targeted, not just quote-unquote targeted individuals. And it galls me that the United States has anything to say about any country mistreating its people. Oh, we have not a leg to stand on. Not a leg. No, not at all. Uh, high up there in terms of human rights violations. Yeah. Well, it's the, pot, it's the pot calling the snowball black is what it is. <laughs> or the pot calling the snowflake black. <laughs> <laughs> oh gosh yes I, absolutely because you know what uh, sorry this is an aside but it's it, um you know when you have these uh, military men and these uh, senior intelligence agents you know criminal psychopathic serial killers and then they try to uh, portray that our problems in the world are due to i don't know what uh you know black people campaigning for rights or women campaigning for rights or you know snowflakes of you know people who are still at university or teenagers not being tough enough no i think the real problems are we've got a bunch of you know uber tough serial killing psychopaths in in leadership positions i think that's our problem in the world you know but uh, that aside you know listening to all this i'm thinking right ladies so what are we going to do how are we going to take these people down you know and um i think we already you know listed so many different aspects so we can um first of all diffuse this this repeated uh mentioning of uh, conspiracy theory by saying well first of all it's a uh, if anything, we're, we're suggesting it's a business plan, not a conspiracy. Um, second of all, we're also using hypothesis testing in science to actually find out if a conspiracy exists. Also, conspiracies are very widely known in law. There's conspiracy to defraud, conspiracy to commit homicide. It's a staple of the criminal law. Um, and then also we can use this kind of cross calibration between the fields. Um, and then we can also use statistics to, to um, you know, track them down. But I think we can also use many other aspects. And actually now I would like to return to the case of Melanie. Let's dig down 
into what exactly happened and using our knowledge you know of a of an intelligence analyst of a journalist and a scientist let's find out what exactly happened based on the facts and i would like to go back and actually name names of who was involved in what they did um so imagine the sequence of events was that I went to the hospital and let me share my screen so that I can highlight the names of the people involved. So when I went to the hospital, I spoke to Professor Caroline Dalmans and she claimed that uh, Melanie wanted to be put uh, into psychiatry by herself. Now that turned out to be ludicrous and false information. But then what happened is that it was Professor Caroline Dalmans as the senior gynecologist who would have been in charge of the medical care of Melanie um, the day after the birth, and I think it is her fault, I blame her, that she even allowed, oh, sorry, I'm getting, I think I'm getting from Karen's microphone against, again, feedback. Um, sorry, um, I think it was her fault that this entire extraordinary rendition that I think harmed um, Melanie's medical recovery was even undertaken because I think as the senior doctor on the scene she would have been within her rights to say it's not in the best interest of the patient to be dragged to another hospital to be interrogated between midnight and 2 a.m. This is a recovering patient. This is a patient who just had this um, very um, serious and involved operation. I'm sorry, um, you know, the medical interests go before the psychiatric interests and she has to stay here. She could have said that, she should have said that, but she didn't. And I, I really blame her for that. Now, what happened um, on the day that led up to um, Melanie being separated from her baby, again, the story changed several times. The first story that was false was that Melanie requested to be put into psychiatry herself. Then the second story we were presented was that Melanie was said to have talked to a night nurse and would have said to her, that she heard voices and these voices told her that they're going to take her baby away. Um, so now this was the version of events that I heard on the Thursday. And what happened on the Thursday is that in the morning at 11 o'clock, Melanie was interviewed by Professor Marie Delay or Delay. Um, now this woman um, is in psychiatry, so infanto juvenile psychiatry. Um, and she did the first interview with Melanie, which lasted, I think, less than 15 minutes. Now, I think after this interview, um, they came and actually, by the way, they lied to Melanie, by the way. I would like to point that out because they came to Melanie and they claimed that they had seen that her baby might have developed jaundice. They said, oh, the color of the baby seems to have changed. Oh, we just want to take the baby and do tests on it to be sure it's healthy. This was a lie. And Melanie actually looked at the baby and said, I can't see a difference, but they insisted on taking it away. And I think this is how they managed to lie to the mother to take the baby away from the mother, right? Um, I would point flag that also as an irregularity, but then on it goes, because what happened is that after the very first um, interview with um, Marie Delhaye, um, in the afternoon, there was a second interview with uh, three psychiatrists. One of them was called, um, is she? Uh, hang on, let me find her. No, she's on the gynecologist side. So there was an interview with three psychiatrists and um, the psychiatrist um, that was um, present there, the senior psychiatrist, the pedopsychiatrist was Dr. Maya Sombot. Okay, Sombot means um, Saturday in Hungarian. So Dr. Maya Sombot was present in that um, second interview that lasted, I think, 20 to 25 minutes. And at the end, after this, they decided to take a Melanie's baby away permanently. Now, I don't know what happened in those 20 and 25 minutes, but it's those 15 minute and 20 minute interviews that supposedly um, showed to Dr. Maya Sombot and um, Professor uh, uh, Marie Delhai that Melanie is so severely mentally ill that she has to be separated from her baby immediately, right? Now, I think these people are actually guilty of um, medical malpractice. I think they are guilty of medical malpractice and I think they're guilty of being criminally incompetent because um, I have seen Melanie just hours previously and these people are telling us that Melanie developed a severe mental illness. And in a moment, I'll quote the actual court papers 
and show you the precise sentence in the court judgment that um, labeled Melanie as such. And this court judgment was based on psychiatric reports from the 19th. So it must have been based on the report of um, Professor Delhai and um, Dr. Sombot. Um, now, these people tell us that in this few hours where I didn't see Melanie, there was this step function, which we know doesn't exist in nature. Melanie went totally barking mad. And by, I think, six or five o'clock in the afternoon when I saw her again, she was back to normal. And this madness was just, you know, confirmed in a 15 and less than 30 minute interview. So there was this temporary madness in Melanie, apparently. Um, and then... What happened is that a week later, when a judge actually turned up and we finally had the hearing, um, I think the hospital said that when they, they had you know, locked her into psychiatry for almost a week, and during that week, they couldn't see any evidence for se severe psychiatric um, illness. So they had to let her go. So the fact that on Wednesday, the judge said, well, there's no evidence, this, this woman is free to leave, shows again the criminal incompetence of these psychiatrists, Dr. Sombot and Professor Delhai, because her, their opinion was then immediately revised, you know, when a judge actually assessed this. And it was the judge based the judgment on the assessment provided by the psychiatric unit of Erasmus Hospital themselves, right? They couldn't find anything that indicated severe mental illness. So this means these people were criminally incompetent. Yes, they were criminally incompetent in many, many ways, Catherine. You, that's excellent that you point that out. One of the things that Dr. Ed Spencer remarked on on our conversation on Catherine Hines' show, um, you know, Tuesday night, was that um, if, if any of these doctors had just spent 15 minutes with Melanie and looked at her medical reports and actually looked at them, and seeing the clear evidence that indeed everything that she was saying was absolutely true. Indeed, foreign technology had been removed from her throat by a surgeon. This was not a delusion. This was not something she had made up. This was an actual fact. They could have established, you know, in a medical scientific way that this was actual fact. There were no grounds for saying that she's delusional based on, based on her saying that, yes, something was removed from my throat, you see? So their, their basis for that um, charge of mental instability or mental illness or delusion could very well have been dispatched had they both bothered to act like proper doctors, like, you know, scientifically trained medical doctors, and looked at the evidence. That is another sign of criminal incompetence and well, negligence. It, it strikes me that if you have that kind of precedent, then anybody can talk to a psychologist or a psychologist, a, a psychiatrist or a psychologist about a field they know nothing of and get put in a hospital because the psychiatrist or psychologist isn't trained in that. Therefore, they can just declare the person who has knowledge to be crazy because they don't have that knowledge. Is that really what they're for? You know, it's just absolutely ludicrous. Yes, and, and actually let me, let me show you ladies the um, precise wording um, in, the, um, in the judgment that was used. Um, so this is the judgment, you can see the um, tribunal um, of the first instance um, of Francophone Brussels, you know, because there's a Dutch and there's a French part. Uh, Tribunal de la Jeunesse, um, so the youth tribunal, here's the ordinance number that we um, keep quoting. So this is the, the precise document and the, um, the paragraph that's, um, that's actually the, the key paragraph is this one. Um, so, uh, hang on, let me highlight, sorry, it's, it's this bit. I, unfortunately, I can't highlight the text because it's a scanned PDF. But um, what it says, and I try to translate um, uh, live, so based on a medical report um, established on the 19th of October 2017, uh, concluding a uh, <laughs> trouble delirant, is, uh, well, a delirious trouble, a delirious illness, in uh, absence de conscience morbide chez la mère, so in a, a morbid absence of uh, awareness in the mother. So sure. they are, she is um, effectively hospitalized um, under constraint 
um, so of the of the um, psychiatric services of um, hospital Erasmus. So what these people on the 19th of October and the few hours where I wasn't with Melanie, even though I worked with her closely for the entire year before, um, in those few hours, they somehow medically certified and saw they said evidence for del delirious illness and a complete absence of awareness in the mother. Uh, I'm sorry, that's just nonsense. It's just total it is. nonsense. Oh, that's criminal. That is absolutely criminal. You know, it is malfeasance in the extreme. It is fabrication in the extreme. And, you know, Melanie has actually uh, relay, related how that whole thing went down with these pedo psychiatrists coming in in the afternoon, seeing her watch the baby being taken out, and then report that as a lack of affect on her part or a lack of emotion, not realizing that she'd had a long conversation with those people and had questioned the need for them to take her baby at all. She had, in fact, stated very clearly, oh, the baby looks fine. It doesn't have to be moved. I don't think it has to be moved. And they said, no, the baby has to be taken away right now. We have to show it to the pediatrician. So you see, shes it's almost like she was in a prison. She was not in a hospital. These people were acting like prison guards, just grabbing a baby. With some, and, you know, you, you pointed out that that was a lie that they said about the, about the jaundice, you know, pretending that this child had jaundice and using that as an excuse to, to take the child out of the room. Literally, they have ripped that baby from the arms of the mother using a huge, big fabrication a big lie. And that's a crime in itself, you know, so we should really point out all of these crimes. Well, I had a brother oh, I who was born with jaundice and uh, he was born with it. He didn't develop it 15 minutes after he was born or a day after he was born. He was born with it. He was very clearly yellow and jaundiced when he was born. That's just ludicrous that the baby would appear normal and then suddenly develop jaundice. That's outrageous, you know. Absolutely. So we can actually pull in all these, um, you know, uh, medical points and, and uh, proper pediatricians can actually comment on the on the um, validity of, of these statements. Um, and I think what we what we should also um, actually make clear is that what this is um, implying is that we will be bringing criminal charges against Dr. Maya Sombat, um, against Dr. Marie Delhaye. And I personally also advocate for bringing criminal charges against um, Professor Caroline Delmans for neglecting her duty of care, um, the medical care of Melanie Richan, because she agreed to a process whereby Melanie was taken away without painkillers, extraordinary rendition the day after she had a cesarean. Yes. And yes, she was... Absolutely. She was she was the one in charge of Melanie's care, was she not? Because she was the gynecologist. Exactly. She would have been in charge of the medical care issue. And this is also a medical care um, case here, I would say. And do not do not forget the midwife. Oh yes, the midwife. Well, I've got a special, like a special pedestal for the midwife because she, it turns out to be pivotal. Um, so the the way things unfolded is that first, um, Professor Delmans misinformed me with this false statement that Melanie had requested to be put into psychiatry. That was nonsense. Then the second claim, which was from a um, a nurse um, called Lamine, Lamia. Um, she said that she overheard and her impression was that they had taken the baby away because um, Melanie was said to have said to a midwife that she heard voices in her head that told her that they will take the baby away. Melanie immediately on the Thursday afternoon disputed that and said, this is wrong. This is false. I've never said anything like that to the nurse, to the nurse at night. We were talking about breastfeeding and other things to do with maternity. So like what you would obviously talk about to a nurse, right, after you've given birth. So. Melanie's story made perfect sense. The story that was, again, hearsay evidence from this nurse didn't make any sense at all. Knowing Melanie, I know that to be absolutely false. But more than that, um, on the day after I questioned Professor Dalmans, I said, I want to have the names of everybody who was involved in this. And she assembled an entire group. She was there. Um, another junior, oh, I've, got, I've got the names in my, in my notebook. So another... Um, a uh, gynecologist was involved. She was very young. I don't think she was involved in this. I would like to leave her out. But then another person was there, a psychiatrist representing the psychiatric unit, and that was Dr. Frederick Milson. 
Um, and then there were this nurse, um, Lamia, and then this, the senior nurse who was, I think, in charge of the nurses that shift. Now, in that conversation, I addressed um, Dr. Frederick Milson and Professor Caroline Delmans, and I said, can you give me a full list of all the concerns that led to the baby being taken away? Now, neither Professor Delmans nor Dr. Frederick Milson named this hearing voices. This came from the nurse. So I would propose that neither Dr. Milson nor uh, Professor Delmans were even aware of this hearing voices claim at that point. And this is Thursday afternoon. And these are the doctors who supposedly took, off the, took over the shift from the medical care and psychiatric care um, shifts previously that were in charge um, you know, of the entire operation of taking the baby away. So the two head people had no knowledge of this hearing voices claim. When I questioned these two, Frederick Milson said to me, um, well, she claims to have a throat, um, had some object in her throat. Um, sorry. Um, and then the second claim was that Melanie claimed that there were people who um, repeatedly broke into a flat. And I said, well, both of those statements are true. I analyzed the throat implant myself. By the way, um, people could see a massive scar on Melanie's throat throughout this entire time. A massive surgical scar that was visible and was from this operation when the throat implant was removed and i said yes it was a synthetic implant i analyzed it myself in switzerland and we have the doctor's statement who removed it and as far as the break-ins are concerned the house breaking has been certified in a written testimony two written testimonies actually from neighbors who even questioned the burglars they even spoke to them so those are true facts and i i communicated this to frederick milson but he ignored the evidence and I think there lies another avenue. So let me just, re sorry. I, I was going to say what they've done essentially is they are re-victimizing the victim. You know, Melanie has been a victim of break-ins. Oh yeah. She's been a victim of covert implantation and um, she has the evidence to prove it. And people have, her own neighbors have attested to it. And now we have a hospital calling her delusional and victimizing her extremely by taking her child away, for daring to speak about COVID implantation and break-ins. So you see, it's really the, the, trail, the trail of crumbs here leading to the intel agencies who are trying to keep this quiet is pretty evident, I think, for anyone to see. Oh, absolutely. Oh, it's very typical. And, and, and you know what? Even more so um, on the topic of break-ins, I would like to say that on the last two occasions that I was um, at Melanie's um, home in Brussels, I too was a, vic a witness to break-ins. Um, so on both occasions, they came in, they broke in, and they uh, misplaced items demonstratively, and they also smeared the, the cutlery and the, the plates on the, um, on the drying rack um, next to the sink with a yellow substance. And um, on both occasions, I cleaned dishes myself, and I knew that those dishes were clean when I placed them. So I myself was a witness. Oh, and another thing I remember, they also came in, and they... Um, so they demolished um, bits of um, Melanie's, um, what's it called, the, um, her bathroom door. They actually pulled the bathroom door out of the hinges and damaged the hinges so badly that I, neither I nor Melanie, could actually physically screw it back in because the screws were bent. So this was not a force that either her or I would have had to actually bend the screws. We had to call um, a friend, a man, to help us to get that um, repaired again. And also, I was a witness just this time before the birth where they uh, came in and they broke Melanie's shower head. So I was the person who actually went out and bought a new shower head for her. So I personally was again a witness to a break-in that happened just in the week before the birth, right? And as you know, this is also going to the police. Um, yeah, so and that the is fact is these break-ins are indeed happening, you see, and you are not the only one reporting it. So what you are reporting currently is corroboration for the reports of the break-ins that she's made earlier. Exactly. And actually, one more point. It's, um, it's even more than that, because when I spoke to um, Melanie's father now, she, if, sorry, he confirmed that her flat was broken into even when he was visiting. And he showed me photographic evidence that will be part of the, the court case where he photographed the broken hinges on the bathroom door himself. And when I mentioned the, this issue with the bathroom door, he said, but hang on, I saw the same thing. And he saw it, I think, in, in the summer of 2016. So what we have is now evidence that the break, repeated break-ins into Melanie's flat have been going on for several years. There are several um, witnesses and were going on up to the week um, before the birth. 
right? So what that means, and Melanie has made many police reports, when the police refuse and cannot seem to be utterly unable to investigate um, break-ins, when they occur almost weekly into the same flat, um, this means that the police or the intelligence agencies are involved. Absolutely, yes. yes. And no, actually, I had break-ins too from NSA. Oh, yes, you know, and me came too. In. Yeah. Oh, I've had break-ins I mean, it's too. the I same petty stupidity. NSA, but yeah, I've had break-ins too. Actually, actually, ladies, I'll be back in a minute. I have to show you some evidence from the newest break-in into my home. I'll be back. So oh, keep, stay well, tuned. Maybe Karen can talk about her break-ins by NSA, that she caught NSA at. Well, yeah, the, the first time that I noticed, I, uh, I saw the gentleman... Huh. Uh, walking away from the house in a place where he had to have left the side door of the garage. And so that's mm -hmm. when we went in the house and started looking around to see if there was anything missing. We didn't see anything mm -hmm. obvious about, you know, like a TV or something. But when I went out the back door, which is a sliding glass door, mm -hmm. and when I touched the handle, it fell to the ground. It had been, the screws had been sawed very cleanly, mm -hmm. very smoothly. And then it was replaced, hoping that we wouldn't discover it for a while. And that's when they, Ended up uh, taking extra car keys, house keys, and mail keys. Oh, wow. And at that point in time, our mail started coming late or not at all. And I had started writing FOIA requests that they didn't want me to get the answers for. Mm. So, yeah, the break-ins are very typical of uh, the intelligence community as well as their civilian proxies. Exactly. And actually, now, now I've come back. I had to get a piece of evidence, which uh, for obvious reasons, I had to keep in a cool place. Because um, whilst, while I was away um, to Brussels, um, I had two break-ins. In the first break-in, they actually stole three of my measuring devices, my big yellow Geiger counter worth 500 euros. Um, and then the two de uh, measuring devices I used repeatedly, one of them was the bug detector worth roughly, well, just short of 200 euros. And the, um, uh, the green EMF acousticom also worth something like 150 to 200 euros. So I think the total damages amount to something like 800 something euros. Um, that was a break in um, just the day I left for Brussels and they removed these three measuring devices because they knew that Melanie and I were going to do scientific measurements at the university and those measuring devices were instrumental. So it was targeted sabotage, removing these measuring devices from a suitcase with two laptops, leaving the two laptops and taking the measuring devices. So that was classic Intel. But when I returned home, I found a blue uh, post-it note on my desk with three words. I have to find blue post-it notes somewhere. But then when I went up to the attic to return the empty suitcases to their place, I found a dead bird. Sorry, this is the dead bird, oh, which I would man. like to, sorry, it's gruesome, but I would like to submit it for evidence. It was placed um, in the middle of the room that's also very you know, unusual when a bird just happens to die exactly in the middle of the room next to the empty suitcases. So they would know that I would return the suitcase and find this dead bird. Um, now, the, the bird wasn't trapped um, in the attic when I went to pick up the suitcases. But also was telling me, I'm not sure if I, I can or should show you this in greater detail, but the bird actually has its eyes gouged out. Oh, no. So, oh, yeah. this is terrible. Because, you know, there's, so, there's such an attitude of intimidation and threat it's like a death threat yes. yeah you know that's precisely what it is. i've i've had dead i've had dead creatures placed in my path too just on no, my me walk. too yeah yeah in the yard i'm, I'm so glad yeah. you confirmed it yes. ladies because um i could only reference the case of philip kerr who had dead rats placed by mi5 mi5 placed dead rats in his path over and over. That's the famous case of Philip Kerr versus MI5. And then when I spoke to, um, I think some acquaintances of Paolo Fiora in London, um, a lady confirmed that she had dead birds placed on her on her um, front entrance repeatedly. And of course, dead bird, uh, double meaning in English is also dead young woman or dead woman, right? So you are a dead bird uh, is kind of the implication. It only works in English. Mm -hmm. So um, I think uh, this is maybe more British in Intel or Swiss Intel in charge of, you know, tasked by British Intel. It's a bit shit, really, but I, I will drag this to the police station and show them. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that you're dealing with. So I had now two break-ins um, around the time of going to um, Brussels. And then this entire thing unfolded. There were break, repeated break-ins whilst I was there in Brussels. Um, and that has the hallmarks of the, of the intelligence agencies written across it. So I think it is fair to say that everything, this entire debacle that unfolded, is the handiwork of, um, you know, 
Jacques Reis, head of Belgian intelligence and his crew, I would say, personally, I would think that everything that happened is actually a planned um, intelligence operation and Jacques Reis is in charge of um, domestic Belgian intelligence. So I would say the criminal charges also involve him. I think the criminal charges should be against the um, doctors at the hospital who pulled this off and certainly also Jacques Reis. I think this is a criminal operation. This is what I um, concluded looking at the evidence. And um, I think it's related to Belgian intelligence and um, because of um, the connotations with child theft. And, yes. um, you know. and you know, it's, it's um, a retaliation for revealing the covert implantation that they themselves engage in retaliation for founding an organization that is indeed dealing with issues like overt implantation by the intelligence agencies and electromagnetic radiation weapon attacks from this conglomerate of intelligence agencies, military groups, and, um, and who else? The local mafia, really. The, the corporate contractors who are all part of that little network. So it, it's, uh, it's both retaliation and it's it's an attempt to keep covert implantation completely secret. It's an attempt to keep these radiation weapons completely secret. It's, um, it's a kind of a suppression activity. You know, it's, that's what they're striving to do over here. And the reason I think that we are, in a sense, involved, because we are part of the same joint investigation team that Melanie is on. Um, Melanie's founded this fantastic organization, Ecator, which is helping to scan, provide scans for people who are reporting covert implantation. So she's helping to unearth the medical evidence that can be used in a court of law to gain justice for these victims from the conglomerate of military intel private contractors who are running these operations, these deadly operations, breaking into people's homes, implanting people, and using electromagnetic radiation weapons on their bodies. Absolutely. And I think we should also specifically highlight how um, we as the JIT came to the conclusion that um, this is also related to illegal implanting um, of people. Um, and, and let me just uh, stress that because there's a deductive chain that leads to that conclusion. Because um, when I um, spoke on the Thursday, just after they took the, the baby away, um, when I was at the um, hospital, I questioned Dr. Frederick Milson, who was the psychiatrist there at this meeting that was called by Professor Delmans. Um, it, this meeting took place in Melanie's um, uh, hospital room, and there was this entire group of people, um, you know, seated there. And I asked, what were the points of concern? So the nurse Lamia floated this thing that Melanie supposedly had said, which wasn't true, had said that she heard voices to um, the night nurse. This was not true. And actually, this version of events was then revised later. But then the other points of concern were raised by um, Dr. Frederick Milson, this guy, you know, here, I point him out because he is on the hospital website. And I think we should bring criminal charges against this guy as well. Um, he said that the two points of concern were the, um, the fact that Melanie claimed that she had an implant in her throat um, and that there were repeated break. She claimed that there were repeated breakings into her home. Both of them are documented facts. Now, I pointed out to Dr. Frederick Milson that those were true facts and he didn't change uh, the course of action that psychiatry took. I think this implies a criminal conspiracy. Okay, this is very, very important. Now, um, Frederick Milson um, was also the person who removed um, our um, friend that was with us that day. Um, he removed this person at um, 6.30 p.m. and claimed that the visiting times are over. However, what's so interesting is that Frederick Milson came from the um, psychiatric unit and he was giving orders on the uh, gynecology unit, on the maternity ward. So that's another thing that for me implies that uh, Dr. Frederick Milson might be a bit too cozy with Intel because he was taking all the strategic steps to remove a witness. And it was also Frederick Milson who came um, um, I think uh, an hour or two later and removed me as a witness claiming that my rights as the accompanying person um, of Melanie Richan had expired um, when the baby was taken out of the room. I think that's a nonsense rule. 
Um, and I, I say it again, I think it's a nonsense rule because um, babies that are born early are sometimes taken to the neonatal unit and put into incubators. Um, and at that time, I don't think the rights of the father or whoever the accompanying person is, is extinguished just because the baby is in the neonatal unit. I think the, the accompanying person has a duty of care towards, um, you know, uh, the, the person who's hospitalized, so in this case, Melanie Richard, and therefore has a right to, to visit her 24 seven. I think that's the real role. Um, but anyway, so Frederick Milson was instrumental in removing the both, um, both of the uh, witnesses. Okay. So this makes him pivotal in the entire saga, but also he was, um, he was totally impervious to me providing evidence that uh, corroborated what um, Melanie Richan said. And later on, after I'd been removed as a witness, there was another confrontation, well, not confrontation as in a bad way, but just a confrontation of facts um, when uh, Melanie was informed that they are going to call the police and transfer her with the police to this other hospital. Um, at that point, she spoke to Frederick Milson and she got out her laptop and said, listen, here are the um, images, the images that we've also shown on the Techno Crime Fighters Forum that prove that I had a synthetic um, implant in my throat. And those were the measuring re measurement results and images from the Swiss lab. And Frederick Milson refused to look at the evidence when Melanie produced it on her laptop. He refused. Later, when the police arrived, um, that was a police officer called Cowles, I think. So uh, when Officer Cowles arrived, Melanie showed the evidence to him, and it was the police officer who ordered and who had to order Frederick Milson to look at the evidence. When Frederick Milson then complied, he just shrugged and he said, Yeah, but now a process has already been started, so that's not relevant. Now, I think I would classify all that to be actually um, part of a criminal cover up. Oh, yeah, and outrageous. That's most definitely criminal, Catherine. I mean, think of it. Here you have a doctor, once again, a doctor being given an opportunity to act like a doctor, you know, to act like a scientist and examine the evidence. And what does he do? He gives it a curse from it. Melanie says that he looked at it for two seconds. He turns away from it and said, oh, no, but it's now it's already been organized. The, the process has been started. The process has been started by this nebulous, you know, third person. And we are simply going to fall in and, you know, go on with it. What absolute well, nonsense. It was the psychiatric department that actually started the whole process. Well, let's extrapolate this again. All right. The process has started. Sorry, we cannot, we cannot cease it. All right. Let's say you come in. And you're told that a person, one of your patients in room 11, uh, has gangrene of, of his left arm. So you prepare the surgical area to take the arm off. And somebody goes, wait, wait, you've got the patient from room 13, not 11. They only have a, a bowel obstruction or something like that. And then you go, no, sorry, the process has already started. We're going to have to remove his arm. Does that make any sense? That's yes, exactly. that's exactly what it is. Brilliant analogy, uh, Karen. Absolutely. That's exactly right. You know, the process has been started. We can't stop it. You know, it's like, you know, Donald Trump already pushed the nuclear b uh, button and, you know, the world's going to blow up anyway. So please just bunker down. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. And actually, um, so this, it just shows how ridiculous this entire thing is. And then um, I think the other person we should bring criminal charges against is this, um, the person that they, um, uh, Melanie spoke to at night at Hospital Brookman, because he let his independent psychiatric opinion um, be overridden, which I think is criminal. It's, um, it's oh, falsifying true. medical, um, you know, medical statement. And he actually was stupid enough to confess to Melanie that this is what's happening. So, um, you know, and this was, it, when it was still fresh, that was actually, um, you know, um, stated to me. Melanie stated um, his first original opinion after the first hour when she Skyped me, I could see her face and I could say that she was saying the truth. I could also see that she was not in a hospital bed, but actually in, a, in an office being interrogated in an office, which in itself is criminal. So I would say if um, that guy is a doctor, which he should have been, he should be struck off because he did not have the um, best interests of the patient in mind. So that guy is also on, on the list for criminal charges. But then I would like to highlight um, another two people who I would um, want to bring criminal charges against. And that is the um, doctor who was in charge of Melanie once she was on the psychiatric ward. And that person 
also behaved very oddly, um, and that is um, a woman called uh, Dr. Arui. Okay, now this is a very interesting person because um, so Dr. Arui um, is um, said to be associated here with the um, psychiatry and sleep laboratory department, but when I open that site here and I go to a keep, which is the uh, personnel, she's not listed in this list. Um, so I can't find Dr. Arui anywhere here. She doesn't appear. So she only appears as a standalone um, page in, uh, in web space on the Hospital Erasmus website, which is very interesting in itself. I mean, on a normal day, I wouldn't flag this as worrisome, but when you're dealing with um, the intelligence agencies, as we've just outlined that we are, we are doing in this case, you're also dealing with fake personas. You know, the, 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 the crisis actors, the staged, um, you know, actors and so on so if you don't have people suddenly not appearing in listings i would almost flag this as a point of concern certainly a point of investigation so dr arui was um excelled in the department of uh, really odd behavior and irregularities because she herself as the doctor in charge of um, melanie on the psychiatric ward was totally impervious to being shown any sort of evidence um, you know, I showed her evidence. Um, she was um, she was passed evidence about this throat actually throat implant existing. The um, the the um, evidence and testimony for the break-ins existing. We showed that evidence on um, in meetings in the psychiatric ward. Um, we had the evidence on Melanie's laptop, and I had it on my laptop, um, and that didn't register with the psychiatric department. But also, Dr. Ari engaged in certain um, ways of presenting information to Melanie that I would class as psychological warfare. So for example, it was Dr. Arui who just before the judge, uh, the hearing with the judge, um, said to Melanie that um, the psychiatric department would be applying for um, an extension of her stay for another 30 days or 40 days. Okay, so this is the same doctor, Dr. Arui was also present at the um, hearing with the judge um, and there she said that her um, psychiatric department didn't find any evidence for um, any mental illness in Melanie Richard. And just shortly when she was alone with Melanie, she still stressed, she made a point of stressing to Melanie that um, her um, uh, unit will be applying for an extension of her stay with the judge. Now, why would you possibly, as the doctor has been treating Melanie, treating in inverted commas, Melanie for um, you know almost a week, why would you say to the patient, listen, I, we think you're so ill, we have to keep you here for 30 to 40 days. And then when you're in front of the judge, you would say, um, my Lord, we didn't find any evidence for mental illness in this woman. Hmm. Well, also Melanie explained that it had to do with the observation time, right? They were trying to actually buy time to say we want to keep her for another 40 days to observe her closely because there's this, you know, insidious mental illness which is lurking deep beneath the surface. So we have to keep watching and watching and waiting for, the, for 40 days. And isn't it curious that previously they could immediately certify it, you know, with certainty to a judge within a 15 and 25 minute meeting. It was so obvious it was there. And then it suddenly became so elusive. It would have taken them 30 to 40 days. These so-called experts would have <laughs> taken such a long time to even detect a whiff of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you see, there was no evidence of it. And so they needed to find evidence of it, you know, evidence to come up with their um, famous uh, DSM symptoms, a list of symptoms to pull exactly. out. Exactly. And what's Lack also the effect, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then there's well, stalling is a big part. Stalling is a big part of the psychological uh, attacks and the intelligence community attacks. Stall, stall, stall. Exactly, because they're biding and time. What they're doing now? They're doing now for the, with the baby. You know, they're doing that with the baby. They're not letting her see the baby for the thirty days, and and now yeah. they're talking about extending that thirty days. Oh, it certainly mm -hmm. sounds like they're trying very hard to steal that child. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. And and you know what? We should what we should do, and this is why I took such great care to outline the people who I think um, have behaved criminally, because I think we should be lodging criminal charges in that time. We should use that time to actually lodge criminal charges against these people. Um, and um, all these people I named, I think, have behaved, behaved criminally, and we, we actually, um, it's our duty to, to do that. Well, I had a question about the midwife. And Melanie says basically that the midwife lied 
and then you spoke to her and she lied. So why is the hospital not concerned about a midwife who has at least two people saying that she's a pathological liar? Exactly. And this is just come back to the fact that the hospital changed several times their story of why they're keeping Melanie. So um, they think there were three different stories. Number one was, oh, Melanie requested it herself, which was immediately debunked. The second one was um, from the nurse and uh, neither Dr. Milson nor um, Dr. Dalmans were aware of it at the time, it seemed, which was that she was um, said to have said to the night nurse that she heard voices and they told her that they take the baby away. And then there were two more points, which is the throat implant and the break-ins, which were true and were immediately debunked. So they were left with the story that Melanie said that to the night nurse. And so I immediately requested on the day in that meeting, I said, give me the name of the night nurse. And what was also so telling is that was meant to be the shift that all of these people had taken over from and the nurse had taken over from, and yet no one could remember her name. You would think that if, if this is the pivotal evidence that um, Dr. Delhai and um, Dr. Sombat, sorry, Professor Delhai and, and Dr. Sombat, pl um, place their expert um, expertise on and expert testimony on, they would remember the name of the nurse who came up with that story, but they couldn't. They couldn't. And this implied to me that it was a lie and it corroborated what Melanie said because she said it's a lie. And then came the third version of events when we debunked all these and they saw that they can't run with that and the last version of events was that i talked to the midwife who was present during the birth and i had said to that midwife whose name we still don't know i think she only said she's called elaine or helen uh, no idea we still need the surname um and the, the final story it's was Niemand. yeah Niemand. nobody exactly <laughs> And, um, you know, I and the final story was that I had talked to that nurse and I had said to her that Melanie um, hears voices. And for the last couple of days, she couldn't sleep because the voices told her that they're going to take her baby away. Now, that final version is even more interesting because it would mean that these expert psychiatrists uh, incarcerated Melanie and put her through the trauma of separating her from her, um, her baby based on hearsay evidence that they didn't bother to corroborate with me because, hey, I was there on Thursday. Why did no one ask me what I'd said? I specifically, I myself asked what were the points of concern and they didn't raise this point with me. So it implies that they have lied three times. Oh, and you know, Catherine Hine made the very important point. She asked me, and I didn't know the answer to this. I thought I, I told her I would ask you. She said at that court hearing when that nurse midwife was there and those psychiatrists were there, did you all, um, did they all raise their hands and, you know, take an oath to say they were speaking the truth? Is this an issue of perjury? Because in the US, it would be an issue of perjury if they lied in front of a court. This is a very good point, Ramola, because the court hearing I attended on Wednesday, I would classify as a kangaroo court. Um, and not because of any fault of the judge, because in that judge, I couldn't see anything wrong. It was the setup. There were no oaths. There were no oaths. No one mm. was bound by an oath. Also, yeah. the midwife, who was in the end turned out to be instrumental and pivotal in the case, wasn't at the hearing. The person who was at the hearing was Dr. Arui. Um, it was Melanie Richan, um, her lawyer, um, a psychologist that uh, corroborated, you know, Melanie's persona and said that she was mentally ill and, and myself and Melanie's father. And then there was also another person sitting next to Dr. Arui. And after the end of the court hearing, when I thought I will write a, you know, an actual um, written um, write-up of this, I need the names of everybody present. I went after these two, Dr. Arui and this woman, and I said, excuse me, can you give me your name? And this woman refused to give her name. So she this refused. Dr. Ari refused to give you her name. Dr. Ari ignored. I mean, I happened to afterwards work out that she was Dr. Ari, but she just kept on walking and ignored my question completely. And the other woman actively turned around and said, I'm not going to give you my name. I will report that. Yeah, that, that's, that's the, um, and the reason she gave was, um, I'm not going to give you my name because you have done enough damage to this hospital. I think that those were her words. <laughs> I thought she really thinks she could escape, you know, uh, anything beyond by uh, refusing to give her name. Exactly. And, and you know what, when we, when we, when we look back at this case, sorry, I'm just getting echo from one microphone. I think we should map out how this entire thing unfolded, what the irregularities were and um, how these people changed their lives for lies they were, I have to say, you know, 
And now the final the version of events is that I said, apparently it's claimed that I said it to the midwife, which is nonsense because not once in this entire year that I worked with Melanie was I ever involved in measuring somehow, you know, voice transmissions to her ear. Because by the way, even if Melanie had said, even if, which she didn't, if she personally had said, I'm hearing voices and they're taking my baby away, it would be an implication of ear implants because she also has photographic evidence that I've seen about scars that appeared behind her ears. She has that. So then it's a question of the physics and the actual medical physics of the implants. And then we would have to track down the implants and question Jacques Reis, head of Belgian intelligence, why he would be putting in his men and women, his people, voice transmissions to uh, a woman who's just given birth and telling her that they will take her baby away. Wouldn't that be an implication of, you know, severe psychopathy and Belgian intelligence? So even if Melanie had said that, knowing that she's implanted to the absolute hilt, it would not be an implication of, you know, schizophrenia or paranoia. It would be an implication that there are chips in her ears and it would explain the scars on the back of her ears. So even on that count, these people would be out. But Melanie didn't even say that. And I never had in the past any dealings with her trying to measure her ear implants. What I did have is, um, actually now that I think about it, I think there's a video where I'm scanning her body and I think, I actually, I think I have a video where I'm using my bug detector and I can actually measure frequency emissions from her ears, by the way. I think I even have that photo document, so I should dig that out for the court case. But Melanie didn't even say anything about um, voice transmissions because they weren't even the issue. Right, she couldn't sleep for the days before, right? And I couldn't sleep for the days well, before. Well, remember, remember, Catherine, that we are dealing with um, stunted thinking over here. We are dealing with uneducated and uninformed psychiatrists. These psychiatrists are indeed acting like the strong arm of the law, and to this day, they still maintain that when anybody reports voices, they are to be instantly considered delusional and schizophrenic. Because in the psychiatric world, by design and by reason of that DSM, they have decided that voices are completely equated with schizophrenia. They have refused to recognize the fact that military technology exists to put voices into people's heads. You know, that there is all sorts of technology now. There's V2K, there's bone conduction, there's the neurophone which sends um, voices and sound up, the, up, up, the, up any nerve of the body. There's skin conduction, there's microwave hearing, there's, you know, uh, microwaves can be sent to the back of the skull, to the auditory cortex. Um, so there's all sorts of military technologies now in use. Some of them are well known and they're in the public domain. There are articles written about them and I can point them to it. But there are also classified technologies that are being used. So that is the truth about voices in people's heads today. However, psychiatrists, the entire medical world is pretending complete obliviousness and complete ignorance of this matter. They are sticking to their guns in this day and age, 2017, you know, November 2017. They are sticking to their guns and saying, if anybody reports hearing voices, it means they are delusional. So that is the situation. That is the absolute situation with the system. So we need to be very aware of that. That's the situation. That's the system. They are pretending absolute ignorance of military technology that can put voices in heads. So being aware of that, you know, that's the, the whole issue of military technology, the voices and heads is perhaps not something that needs to be applied in this particular case. In this particular case, it was an issue of implants, foreign technology removed from Melanie's throat. And there was absolute medical evidence for that. So they had no business fabricating stories about voices and heads, which clearly somebody did. And, you know, as you've just analyzed and shown, that's a way in which that kind of points to rather a setup, a script already in place, which probably didn't have anything to do with your speaking to this midwife. It's almost as if they were just waiting for an opportunity to pull Agreed. that out. Absolutely agreed. It was a setup. They are waiting for key words and they were never spoken, so they spoke them. Exactly. They made them up. 
voices yeah. and heads people reporting voices and heads actually um so the, the thing is i did talk about voices and heads via implants but it wasn't even applied to melanie and the way it came about is as follows because what i did talk um to the midwife about and this was out of genuine medical concern and i think i'm totally within i mean not just um within my rights but actually within my duties to point that out um the the issue was so melanie had this throat implant and one very large part three and a half centimeters by one and a half by one and a half centimeters was removed from her throat but there's a second part of it that's still in her throat and it still um can be used to strangulate her and um cut off her um air pipe and it's being used as that and it gives her extreme difficulties breathing when she's lying on her back so when she's going through a major operation lying on her back my first concern was can she breathe and i felt at many times that she was actually in distress and she couldn't breathe um properly this was my impression because i couldn't really and i could communicate with melanie but you know i i had to gauge that um and um the, what I did say to the midwife is that I was the person who had analyzed um, this thing that was taken out of her throat, that I knew it was synthetic, that the second part was in there and it was obstructing her air pipe when she was lying on her back. And I said to the midwife, well, I don't want to bring it up as an issue, but I want everybody to um, be aware, should anything happen during the operation, you know, and there are medical procedures where you need to be, um, you need to push something maybe through the air pipe, you know, in an emergency, you have to be aware that something is obstructing the air pipe okay that's something that a doctor might not expect to find there all right and i said you can verify that i'm saying the truth because you can see the massive scar on her throat from this operation now for all of this we have evidence okay and actually you know melanie will have another operation to have the second part taken out of her throat so all that is is true um but then based on this conversation the midwife got interested and at the time i just took her to be a midwife now under the light of what has happened i almost suspect that she might have been somebody close to the intelligence um, world maybe even an agent who's been placed there carefully by my side to be very trustworthy knowing full well that i'm you know very forthcoming about this um information that is true because melanie and i we even spoke on the german version of techno crime fighters form repeatedly about this throat implant so what had happened is that after the birth when this midwife took the baby away to be measured i had to follow her because my task was to keep an eye on the baby and she questioned me so at that time melanie wasn't even present okay so none of the conversations between the midwife and i melanie didn't even hear them because she was either you know partially sedated or totally exhausted and actually in recovery so you know with painkillers of all sorts and um she was not even sometimes for a large part of the conversation even in the same room so when i was questioned um what the midwife said is oh tell me more about your work so i explained more about the jit and i said we are you know and in joining an investigation to do with um, the criminal implanting of people. And then she said, oh, so what sort of implants are there? And I said, well, it's for example, the one in Melanie's throat. I said, but there are many, many others. And she said, so what sort of implants, what can they do? And then in general terms, I listed and I said, well, you know, people are implanted typically by a symmetric pattern across their body, which is called a body area network. And I said, these chips are typically on top of the head, the back of the head, the neck, you know, in the limbs, sometimes in the facial regions, all over the body. And um, sometimes they are implants um, to do with the senses, so implants in the eyes and implants in the ears. And I said the implants in the ears can be used to submit noise and um, voice transmissions and a lot of the victims are tortured by that either by loud noises tinnitus or also by you know um words and these words are typically death threats or people say we're going to kill you you're going to develop cancer you're going to have an accident and that sort of stuff so i was talking in general terms and even that what i said at the time is totally true so that was then portrayed to me saying specifically to the midwife about Melanie that Melanie specifically hears voices that tell her that they're going to take her child away. And this is for this reason that she was, um, you know, kept awake for several days before the birth. This was the final version of events. And this is a lie. I never said such a thing. You know, so this is now the third version of the lie. And again, I can debunk it because Melanie and I never, ever had any dealings where I had any sort of investigative work to do with her you know her hearing voices or any such thing the only yes, times absolutely. i've worked with her 
I was literally the throat implant that I investigated at the Swiss lab, and there's an entire paper trail about that. And the second thing is that her and I, we worked together with the Belgian university trying to measure the remaining chips in people's bodies, this body area network. And for that, there's a long paper trail as well. And that's that. But there's no paper trail. I'm glad you spelled it out. Transmissions. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you spelled it out, Catherine, because I did report that as well, that indeed, you, as you had reported to me earlier, that you did indeed have a long conversation with the midwife about the general nature of implants. You know, you did not in any way ascribe to Melanie these particular kinds of implants, nor did you say at any time, from what I understand from what you said and from what you say right now, that you ever said that Melanie was hearing voices. So that's a flat out lie that this woman has, you know, pro produced. And, and that's criminal because on the basis of that lie, psychiatry has been used to take Melanie away from her baby. So it, it is a pivotal kind of point. It's very um, crucial to note that. It's very important to note that. And, you know, to hold that midwife responsible for that massive lie. And she can get away by saying, as she said to you apparently at the hearing, that, oh, that's my version of things. that I reported it as I remembered it. You know, kind of making space there in there for some kind of memory loss and, you know, perfectly normal memory loss. This is how we all remember and misremember things. Yes. Yes, yeah, sure. But, you know, you're talking about an, a case with somebody's baby and somebody's life with their daughter is at stake. Actually, it's even, even more criminal than that because, um, first of all, the midwife wasn't present at the hearing on the Wednesday. So the Wednesday was exactly a week after the, the birth. So the hearing was before the judge. The midwife was not present. And That's interesting. That, yes, she was not present. Um, but when we met the midwife again, and this is very interesting. So Wednesday, uh, Melanie gives birth. Thursday, they take the baby away. At, at, during the night, there's the extra laundry rendition. By the way, when she was taken back to hospital Erasmus, she was locked into a room in the basement of the hospital with just a mattress on the floor. This is also not normal procedure. And at the time, I was actually down in the emergency unit where she'd arrived back. And I was then, I can certify that there were several rooms empty and there were several empty beds. So it wasn't for lack of beds. This is, again, part of the CIA, you know, torture um, setup, in my view. Um, but then what's very interesting is that on the Friday, when Melanie was transferred back into psychiatry, her father, whom I picked up from the um, train station, and I went to visit her. And during that meeting, suddenly this midwife appeared. And she said, oh, I just, I was um, off yesterday, so I had a free day, but now I just came into the hospital today and I just heard that they've taken the baby away and I realized, oh, it's because of what I had said. So we said, so what did you say? And she says, oh, well, I wrote in my report, I, I thought the things that I heard from me were so worrying that I had to write, it, um, write a report. And in that report, she wrote this version that, um, you know, I had apparently said that Melanie hears voices and I said to her immediately but I never said that I said I never said that and I can replay the conversation and I can tell you that I was talking to you in most general terms about my work and I can prove that what you're claiming is nonsense and then she I tried to outline the conversation and also the evidence that points to my version being correct and she just shrugged and she says oh well that might be the case it might be a misunderstanding but I've written my report now and that's that and that was on the Friday. So she didn't revise her report. She didn't put in a caveat that she might have remembered. She didn't she actually, put in a report. Hmm? She actually wrote a report. She actually wrote yes. a report, documented this fake conversation. You know, I'm sorry, but I think what we need to do is combat that with some accurate, truthful documentation. And first of all, we need to request that report. I think for the court case because I still haven't seen a trace of that, but I, I do have a statement that she wrote a report exactly. And, but and but remember, you know also, hmm? remember also we need a transcript of the court hearing as well, Catherine. Oh, yes, and that's another thing. No, no transcript. I don't think was compiled. I don't think this is a court hearing. This was a, a kangaroo. I call it kangaroo court hearing oh, in psychiatry. Yeah. It was literally um, a judge and an aide sitting at a desk and with us assembled on a bunch of chairs. Did you record it by any chance? Did anybody record it? If I did, I wouldn't be free to say publicly. Oh, right? sure. Absolutely. Yes. If I would be smart but, enough, um, maybe I would be smart enough however, because my court memory, hearings were sabotaged and the transcript was changed. But anyway. On the other hand, you do have a stellar memory. So perhaps you can record it now, you know, put it down as you remember it now before you forget.
but it, it's I have I have certainly I taken have notes um, absolutely you know, um, a lot of notes about this um, and I'm I will be presenting my version of events but um, you know what's what's also so telling and, and actually I would like to just spend a tiny bit of time I know we've run over time now but it's so important I just would like to say a bit more about the the midwife because what happened with the midwife was that imagine she just turns up um, just um, you know the day after the baby was taken away and claims that just that day she heard about it curiously with the pressures of hospital work she still managed to sit down and write a report which is also very odd and then she resolves to come and speak to us to clear it up but then coming and speaking to us sorry I just get echo um, I'm sorry sorry, sorry. Um, but then coming to to speak to us to clear it all up didn't actually result in it being cleared up afterwards she just came to put down her version of events and when i clarified that there might have been actually huge shortcomings and it would be fair enough that there would be huge short shortcomings because at the end of the day i'm talking about my expert field i spent you know now years um investigating and she just heard it for the first time was listening to me on half an ear and was um examining a baby so if there's anybody who might have gotten things wrong i think on the balance of probabilities it would be her but yet she insisted on this and we were not allowed to submit any sort of reports but she had a direct line to this so she didn't correct it and there were many other odd things because in that conversation i noticed that she was extremely cheerful now this is not a midwife who just you know found out and also she was fairly young that just found out that oh she was responsible for for somebody's baby being taken away so i thought her demeanor did not tally with this you know role that she was supposed to um to play here um but then another th few things were very interesting and and under the um the hypothesis of this being an intel operation i would like to flag the the fact that she had a phone and she received two phone calls in the time that she was speaking to us both were claimed to be from her daughter and she was i would say a bit you know over bullying talking to her daughter she did not sound like a a, a woman who's concerned that she might have screwed up really badly and been responsible for baby taken away she did not have any sort of concern in her voice instead she was overly overly ebullient about her daughter and oh mon chérie and yes da, 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 da. so imagine this is a supposed midwife who was responsible for another woman losing her daughter, making a big spectacle about her talking to her daughter in this meeting where this entire um, issue was meant to be cleared up. Now this doesn't make any sense. So at that point, I already strongly suspected that the Smith wife would have been, you know, Intel. And I remember we had this um, techno crime fighters forum and immediately Millicent also said, I think the midwife might have been placed next to you you know specifically so she had the same hunch as i had but then what happened i think is also very important to point out because on friday night we also before this midwife turned up um we we heard that the judge had decided that no one was allowed to see the baby for 30 days now that's highly unusual because if the daughter's mad why can't the father the next of kin see the baby why can't the accompanying person see the baby you see, they're trying very hard to keep that child away from bonding with anybody in that family, which again is another, you know, red flag about how it seems there are lots of indication, indications being given to us that they are really trying to steal this child. You know, exactly. and when I say they, I'd have to say it's the hospital, the court system and the intelligence agencies working behind the scenes uh, on this giant act of retaliation. Yes, and I, oppression leveled against Melanie. I, I completely agree with you. And then, so taking the baby away has two functions if we're thinking about the intelligence agency hypothesis. Number one would be to inflict trauma, to um, you know, um, prevent any sort of attachment and bonding between family members and, um, you know, um, and the baby. And bonding can also be things like human voice and touch. So anybody holding the baby and talking to it could already cause bonding. So they oh, try to- Oh, you know what else? The breastfeeding. Yes. Be 
because remember that was an issue and i think initially when melanie relayed that you know they had asked i mean literally this is just like something out of auschwitz so she's pumped her breast milk and she tries to give it to the nurse to give to the baby and they say to her no we're not going to give it give it to the baby we're going to throw it down the drain and there was some um you know talk about possibly and i also kind of jumped to this conclusion i guess thinking that oh they were drugging her at the time and so maybe they were trying trying to, uh, you know, or basic, whatever way you look at it, however you slice it, 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 it was criminal what they did, keeping her breast milk from being given to the baby. But perhaps their excuse or their cover story was that she was taking these antipsychotic drugs. However, Melanie just uh, clarified to me last night, I think to all of us, that she was not taking the um, um, heavy psychotic antipsychotic drugs that in fact when they decided to give her a drug it was a drug that they said to her would be compatible with breastfeeding and then it was the breastfeeding actually uh, the breast not the breastfeeding the breast uh, pumping happened afterward when she was beyond you know off the drugs when the drugs had been stopped so she had pumped this breast milk much after that so there was no issue of contamination with the drugs and it was at that time that the nurses refused to relay to take that um breast milk down to the baby that's you know correct. which is also excessively criminal that is a crime to me you know yes. that's a crime against motherhood it is it is and it is actually against um melanie's human rights i think and a baby's human rights as yes, well it's, it, it is a human rights yeah. violation absolutely her rights as a woman and a mother and a yeah. human and, and and you know what? Again, I um so that those are also very interesting um facts because they um entirely isolated the baby um and it's just not to um allow any sort of bonding, not allow the um the breast milk, um and um and it's it, even more than that because you don't I I why would you why would you bar an entire family from seeing the baby? Number one could be bonding. Number two could be because you want to inflict trauma on the baby. This could be even things leaving physical marks, you know, to turn it into a little psychopath perhaps, like MK Ultra, <clears throat> um, you know, or you would also perhaps, if you're an intelligence agency and you have just chipped the mother, as we can prove, maybe you would want to chip the baby. And maybe you want you would want to have the scars to heal, right? And there's several ways to chip people. There's, it could be laser surgery, but there's also a way to chip the brain by um, going through the nasal canals. Now, any sort of bleeding or you know hemorrhaging as a result as a result of that would probably take some days to heal. So you would not want to give anybody access to the baby in that time because they might see that the baby's um, baby has, is having a nosebleed. So. All of these things are the only, I, these are the only things I can think of to explain why yes. anybody would. Yes, thought. it is horrifying. And you know, this is the other thing that they can use the fear of implantation of the baby. Again, they can use that. Psychiatry can even use that against the mother. Oh, so you're worried about the baby being implanted. That shows that you're delusional. That shows that, you know, you're paranoid. You think everybody's after you. You think everybody's after the baby. So you look, this is why psychiatry is being used um, by the intelligence agencies and by the state me mechanism here that we are faced with, the surveillance state mechanism. They see it as a very successful instrument, a very successful weapon, because it's, a, it's the kind of weapon that closes all the doors. Whatever the patient says, they're going to be seen as delusional. You know, once you're in the clutches of a psychiatrist, anything you say, whether you speak fast or you speak slow, whether you're calm or you're not so calm, whatever it is, you're going to be written down as mentally ill from the mo moment that you encounter a psychiatrist. And I speak from experience, as I think we all do, having encountered psychiatrists. And, you know, we can go into that in great detail on another show, perhaps, um, as we must, because... Now, at this point, I think our gloves are off. To completely expose psychiatry, we have to openly challenge and question psychiatry. And we have to speak openly as a society about the excessively weaponized ways in which psychiatry is being used in our midst. Yes, and I, and I think we should also bring criminal charges for medical yes. malpractice and criminal incompetence. I really think so, because everything, you know, there were all these details. So barring the family, um, refusing to give the baby the milk, bre uh, the, the breast milk that was already pumped. Um, also, the criminal drugging of uh, Melanie, 
um, in psychiatry, in psychiatric care at Hospital Erasmus. So, um, you know, we saw Melanie on Friday and on Saturday, she said to us that she, she doesn't feel well because of the drugs they've given her, at which point I hit the roof and I went mm -hmm. um, to the front desk and I said, you will stop these drugs immediately because she's a healthy woman and drugging a healthy woman is criminal. You so did a brilliant it, thing there, yeah. But, but it took, I have to say, it took pressure. Um, and if, you, if you, it takes pressure for doctors to do the right thing, it means that they are medically incompetent. They're you know. brainwashed. These doctors are brainwashed into believing it's okay to use deadly psychiatric drugs on a woman who's just given birth who's perfectly healthy. You know, yeah. just because some psychiatrist on the basis of a 10 minute conversation decides that she's delusional. Exactly, exactly. And these are all signs of utter criminal incompetence. And I want us to take this case, take the pattern, and then apply it to all the other cases in which they've done it. Because these people were so self confident, because I think this entire template has been tested a million times. That's it, exactly. It's been tested a million times. They've gotten away with it a million times. And so they're absolutely complacent, as you say. They're, they're, com they're, they're comfortable in the, in, the, in the notion that this is the way to go. This is their strategy. This is their protocol. You know, you don't question psychiatry. You don't question law enforcement. You don't question the state. You don't question doctors. You don't question psychiatrists. Exactly. You just, and you don't you question just fall family in and law. accept everything. Yeah, exactly. family law and family courts. So yeah. that has to be torn down. That has to be torn Actually, down. And, you know, we should talk a little bit further, probably off, off air, about this whole medical malpractice lawsuit thing, which I know is what Melanie is also probably um, thinking yeah. about or working on. But um, the, the question of liability, the question of accountability, I think that is something we need to pursue. We need to start pursuing this notion of holding individuals responsible and holding them liable and holding them accountable for the dastardly deeds that they commit, the incredible crimes they commit, which are crimes of suppression and oppression and repression, and which are crimes that they're getting away with now only because they have huge mafia networks behind them. Exactly. And, and, you know, taking them down one by one, I mean, before I forget, let me just um, expose um, the total lie of um, Dr. Frederick Milson thinking that anybody talking about implants is anything unusual, because um, this entire debacle happened on the 19th of October and on the 25th of October, yeah, let me just make it big, Hospital Erasmus, yeah, put out a press release um, talking about the implants they put in, a novel type of implant which captures glucose that they are putting, they themselves are putting into diabetic patients in their um, unit of endocrinology at Hospital Erasmus. So Hospital Erasmus is already publicly announcing that they're implanting people for medical reasons, right? So they themselves can't suddenly turn around and say, oh, you're talking about medical or implants of any kind into the body. You must be mad because they themselves just put out the press release. The week That's after. a very important point. That's a very important point. And I think that should go into the evidence package, you know, about implants. Doctors have no right to call people delusional just because they mention implants. You know, exactly. because there were all sorts of medical implants. I spoke about this as well on Catherine Hines' show. There are all sorts of medical implants these days. There are cochlear implants for those who are hearing impaired that have been in vogue since the 80s, 70s or 80s. There are pacemakers. There are um, other kinds of implants now. And uh, somebody, I think, called me or wrote to me and said that there are also um, implants now, tracking implants for people who have Alzheimer's. Yes. You know, it's sort of the same idea as my children and your pets. You know, you keep your, you track your pets so you keep your pets safe. They're using this now for all the patients. They, well, they're trying to sell it now um, as, as a need for mental health patients as well. You see, so I think implanting anybody is, is a highly dubious proposition and uh, should be rejected by all means. But this is the situation. This is what the medical profession is pushing. You know, because yeah. the medical profession, as we know, is tied in with these huge industries that are creating and manufacturing these things, the RFID chips, etc. By and the way, by the way, Ramola, as you were talking about Alzheimer's patients being implanted, your audio was sabotaged. <laughs> it sounded oh, like a computer. Really? Isn't Everything that interesting? Said about Alzheimer's patients being implanted and then tracked remotely. 
<laughs> it's very interesting because at my end, I'm noticing a lot of flickering and people playing with the video over here. So interesting that they also messed with the audio. Yes. So yes, let me repeat that. Thank you for repeating it for me. That, you know, Alzheimer's patients are being tracked with implants. So perhaps that is still illegal and it's being done surreptitiously and covertly. And maybe that's why my audio was interrupted. Um, I think it's but because that's, it's a big deal. <laughs> because it's a big deal and the person who gave me this information certainly gave me some very useful information that's something that we need to look into and investigate you know that um, alzheimer's patients and other other kinds of patients with um, supposed mental illnesses i find the whole you know panorama of mental health highly questionable at this point in time you know what are these people what are these psychiatrists trying to get away with are they just pointing their fingers at pretty much anyone and everyone and calling everybody mentally ill you know through ascribing some particular disorder or the other. There are so many. I think one day we should really work on work through the DSM and look at some of these disorders in the DSM, which I think are laughable. Because they have disorders now, you know, there's ADHD, there's hyperactivity, there's um, there's something called delayed sleep disorder. So if you know uh, you are unable to go to sleep at a certain time. If you have insomnia or if you stay up late at night, then, you know, you, you are going to be diagnosed with a new disorder on the books, delayed sleep disorder. That's and very interesting, especially because people's head chips and the um, electromagnetic irradiation of victims is used to um, keep them up at night. Yes. And in particular, in this, in this new landscape, in this 21st century landscape of electromagnetic radiation assault, remote electroshocking, which keeps people awake, which many people have reported to me, which I am certainly, you know, writing about and uh, doing podcasting about, um, creating a patient, you know, disallow people from sleeping, sleep deprive them with active denial systems used from vans outside their houses or with other means of activating their chips on their spine, giving them intense heat, making them wake up in the middle of the night, or sending um, radio frequencies to their brain to move them from alpha to beta, or the more active kind of uh, brain state, wake them up. I, I, would then, also, also, I would also add one thing that happened to me last night, being machine gunned with, with pulsed energy projectiles, which woke me up at 4 a.m. because I couldn't take the pain, despite, despite the fact that I'm sleeping under four layers of aluminium with head protection. Yes, that, that happens to me too. They wake me up as well with those kinds. That's another favorite form of sleep deprivation, as you know, to, to blast you with microwave shots. Uh, and those are, those are pulsed energy projectiles, as the U.S. No Navy has kindly informed us. So, yes, they do do that. And of course, as you know, Catherine, we're both sitting in uh, rooms shielded with uh, Reflectix. My Reflectix is to the left of the camera today and um, not so much behind. But, you know, I'm being blasted in the face as we sit here. And, you know, so so we know how that goes. They, they, are, they are using these microwave shots. They're using high powered microwaves. These are absolute facts. And, you know, activists and journalists know it, as Karen just, you know, talked about. And I see, unfortunately, Karen has either left or not yeah, been able I think, to I think come back down, down. which is a shame okay. because i wanted to finish off um saying that um based on the investigation that we are running and putting the bits of pieces together i think it's now clear that what we're doing is um we we've come to the conclusion that this is um a criminal investigation we have to run and that we also have to um run it under the hypothesis that it was um a, a, an elaborate operation um set up by belgian intelligence Yes, I and I think, you know, uh, sometimes people are, are quite astonished at how open we are in condemning the intelligence agencies and speaking out about fusion centers. But, you know, the fact of the matter is we are being assaulted by fusion centers and by intelligence agencies. So we are speaking for victims of COVID implantation. We're speaking for victims of electromagnetic radiation weapons, all of whom are being hit by the, the great weapon of psychiatry and being named delusional when they're stepping forward and speaking out about it. And then you've got these co-opted mainstream media journalists coming out to write these trashy, defamatory, libellous articles about reporting victims, calling them, calling them paranoid targeted individuals, etc., cetera, et cetera. Uh, you know, which is all a huge cover-up. It's a massive cover-up to keep the reality of deadly surveillance abuse secret. Because that's what this is. This is surveillance abuse. This is about giving the intelligence agencies and the security agencies way too much power and letting them get away with 
assaulting people using covert radiation weapons, using scalar weapons, using sonic weapons, and using um, covert implantation, uh, and wireless then, body area networks, etc. And again, your audio was, um, you know, sabotaged. It's a key point when you were talking about the media and the media putting out these libelous articles, you know, smearing people as, as oh, delusional. They're, they're never going to let me ha stop me talking about that. You know, I, I know I've been waylaid. I haven't put out my big article yet about the media, but I am going to do that very soon. I've been working on, you know, Melanie's case, as you know, so I've been a little bit distracted the last week. But my next big article is definitely going to be about the media publishing defamatory articles, libellous articles, about reporting victims of torture and surveillance abuse. Because this is a way in which media is acting like a Nazi collaborator in crime, complicity in crime. You know, they are ex exhibiting complicity in crime by publishing lies, publishing distortions of the truth, publishing omissions, and, you know, they're, they're not just lies by omission, these are lies by commission. They are publishing distorted information. They're publishing outright defamation and outright lies and outright deception. And that has to be pointed out. You know, and who better than another writer and journalist to do it? So I will be doing it very soon. Yeah, and I think I think the NSA or whoever you know sabotaged your audio just just applauded you for it and highlighted the urgency with which you should do that. <laughs> Apparently so, and I got a phone call at just that moment as well. So you know, I didn't oh, you even have a minute that. to see who it was. Distraction, disruption, stop her. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's too late. You know, you shouldn't have hit me in the first place. You shouldn't have, you know, set up the, the implant body area network. You shouldn't have, you know, positioned your little covert electronic control grid around me. Um, writers do like to write and do like to speak. And yeah. that's and where I, I am. And I think, you know what, this is, um, you know, um, I, I think this is such a, a, a great way to um, to end also this episode that um, we, we come to realize that there are all these elaborate setups to take children away, to perhaps even implant the children, um, by which the intelligence agencies, who I believe are a front for organized crime, are trying to get their uh, grubby hands on, on children to, to maltreat um, and use for their money-making schemes. Um, and we are the victim of these um, elaborate schemes. Hospitals are involved. Um, they are corrupted. Some of the um, people who we think are doctors are actually maybe in first line um, intelligence agents. Um, and we will continue exposing that. And um, the harder they hit us and the more, um, you know, crackpot schemes they dream up, the more people they expose. So just in this um, um, enterprise, they have pretty much exposed Hospital Erasmus to be, um, you know, a, an intel hotbed. A hospital that is hosting um, intel takedown operations and intel thefts of children. I think this is yes, the absolutely. They, they, they have revealed themselves and exposed themselves in this, and they've also kind of um, exposed themselves to be taken down, you know, they, to be spotlighted currently at this point in time. Um, because by making a big deal out of these implants, they really think the end result that they seem to, to want is for people to rush forward and uh, sort of issue these, what do they call them, these retractions. Oh, did I talk about implants? I'm so sorry. No, no, I don't believe anybody's implanted. No, no, COVID implantation, sorry. No, 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 we, yes, we were a little bit delusional when we started that organization. People, uh, some people do come forward and talk about implants, but you're right, they must be mentally ill. It's just as you say. So you see, I think what they want is a retreat and a retraction. And they're sort of coming down really hard by doing something so dramatic and so cruel as taking a woman's baby away from her, you know, to kind of force that. But I think what they are having is the opposite effect. They are, what they've really done is expose themselves to open challenge and to absolute public exposure of what they're doing, of everything that they're doing. And I think we need to take that opportunity and need to just go for it. Um, so that's the note on which I would like to end. Is there anything final that you'd like to say? We, need, we do need to close. I, I, I just want to say that um, I, I corroborate what you said. They have exposed, actually just one, one last little anecdote. Um, after I, um, I made a lot of noise and got Melanie off her drugs, um, the next day um, I, I went there and um, I'd also spoken to the um, uh, the uh, what's it called gynecologist unit and the neonatal unit, and I'd asked why no one is allowed to see the baby, um, and I had said to them, look. Um, you know, are you hiding something? Could it be the case that you are implanting the baby like the mother was implanted? Because we do have a egregious precedent here. 
And I said that to the people downstairs in the medical unit. And the next day on uh, the psychiatric ward, it was carried back to me. And it was actually a nurse. Very interesting how these people of comparatively um, low education have this astounding self-confidence. And this nurse came to me and she said, oh, yes, but didn't you also say yesterday on the, um, you know, downstairs that um, the hospital might be implanting the baby? And it was exactly the intended reaction was what you said. They intended um, for me to come up with some sort of, um, you know, um, uh, statement saying, oh, I, I never meant that. But I just went exactly the opposite way. And I said, that's right. I think you might be implanting the, the child as, your, or as the mother was implanted. And just deadly silence followed. I said, that's correct. So now what? And I think we should stick by our guns and say exactly that. And, and we should say even more that every action taken by also by the judge, by the way, Judge Sirk, um, seems to corroborate the fact that this is an elaborate scheme to take the baby from Melanie and then potentially to implant it, use it for human experimentation, like the mother, which we can prove that they did. And then, you know, hell knows what else to do with the child. Feed it to the pedophile rings. I don't know. Anything is possible in Brussels and in hospital Erasmus. That's what they've proven. They have proven that anything is possible. No matter how criminal, it is possible at hospital Erasmus. And that's what yes. I would like to finish with. Yeah, that's rather intense, but you're absolutely right. You know, that's they have they have kind of exhibited an extreme um set of um, behaviors over here by uh, criminally removing um, a, a baby from her mother, by falsely charging the mother as mentally ill, and by going, going overboard with this notion of delusional, delusionality being associated with just the very mention of implants. Um, so I think, you know, what you said, the, the, we kind of need to put forward, and it's very easy to do this, the proof that people are being implanted and children are being implanted. And, and, and children are being trafficked and children are being abused in the family court system. So all of these are extreme um, matters for concern for us. We need to put them on the spot here. We need to hold them up, you know, to be um, for, for greater scrutiny. For greater oh, yes. scrutiny and, and, and one thing I just remembered I wanted to say as well. Uh, what we also are doing is we're taking the attacks against Melanie to be um, a personal attack on every single member of the JIT. They have attacked us. They've certainly attacked me. They have misrepresented my work uh, and my words. Um, and I think they're also attacking our, our work because they're trying to damage one of our key investigators who has excelled yes. in the research that she's done. They're calling into question the validity of our work the legitimacy of our work, the validity and legitimacy of what we stand for and what we are reporting. Because what we are doing really is we are investigating, analyzing, reporting and making very public the entire landscape of surveillance abuse that is going on in the US and in Europe and elsewhere in the world as well, but particularly in the US and Europe, you know, through the network of intelligence agencies, military groups and defense contractors. Extreme crimes are being committed Barbaric, savage crimes are being committed by these intelligence agencies and fusion centers in complete secret, using secrecy. They are using secrecy to cover crime. And we are doing an enormous service to humanity by speaking out about it. We are already targeted by them. We're already being hit by them. And therefore, we speak from absolute experience and absolute awareness. So you are absolutely right. What they are doing is calling into question our legitimacy and the work that we are doing. And, um, and we won't stand for it. Why should we? You know, we are here to report human rights violations and we're not going to stop. That's right. That's right. So on this note. On, <laughs> on which note, <laughs> I guess we have to come down from the high plains over here and uh, wish everybody We have to get back else. to fighting. We have to get back to fighting people. <laughs> Sorry. See you next week. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are definitely in fight mode in terms of intellectual fight mode because that's our forte and we are going to stay there. So on which <laughs> note, everybody have a great day and we will see you next week. Thank you very much for watching. Bye-bye.